boats, race cars, and aviation. Yes, we do race partly on a an airport. It's a wonderful mix, and it's race time in the NTT IndyCar Series. You know, many have chosen St. Petersburg as their home, approximately a quarter of a million, including Sebastian Bourdais, who's lived here for some 15 years. But none of those years more special than the last two. What a spectacular start to the season here on the streets of St. Petersburg. Sebastian Bourdain getting ready to go to victory lane for the 36th time. Dives to the inside, twin checkers out. Sebastian Bourdain kicks off the season with a win at the Firestone Grand Prix of St. Petersburg. Two laps to go. They bang wheels and Alexander Rossi spins Robert Wickens into turn number one. And it is Sebastian Bourdais that is going to hold on to the lead. Sebastian Bourdais goes back to back, winning two years in a row. This one's emotional because we had to overcome a few bumps and rolls and a few broken bones to come back in this victory circle. And he won two years in a row in his adopted hometown, coming from the back. Well, unfortunately, to win for a third time in a row, you'll have to do it again. Can you come from 19th and win again? I mean, anything's possible, right? Uh, you know, still Master Honda number 18 was, uh, was quick on Saturday. We've got nothing to show for in qualifying because we didn't turn a single lap. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I think we've got as good a shot as anybody else. And uh, it's going to be a tough race out there, really hot, very, very humid. Long race, close to two hours. So yeah, I think you know you're gonna have to keep your nose clean and make sure you run the distance. You have two tire options. Everyone is starting on the alternate reds. What kind of tire strategies do you think we'll see? I, I don't know. I think Firestone uh, has got a pretty soft street course tire these days, and uh, you know, in a hot, sunny day like that, I, I don't think the, the the softer option tire is gonna last very well. So, yeah, I mean, it, it could be a pretty simple strategy where everybody stuffs some reds and, and goes back to black tires for the, the remaining of the race. So we'll see. I mean, you can play the race a hundred different ways before time and everything. But at the end of the day, it never seems to work out the way you planned it. Well, Lee, he says the car is only so-so, but don't count him out. Let's be tracking Sebastian Bourdais all day, working his way through. Uh, it's going to be a fabulous story to follow, Kev, that's for sure. Born in Le Mans, France, but has called St. Petersburg, Florida home for himself and his wife, Claire, and their two children. They, they absolutely love it here. Happy memories for him, too, in the year that you won, 03. He got the very first pole position here. As we take a flashback, we wind back the clock. There is Seabass grabbing that pole position. You spoiled the party for him on race day, though. Yeah, I mean, he's a tough competitor. Him and I have had a lot of run-ins. You see me on the outside right there trying to make a move. I think I started third or fourth and ended up winning the race. But he's won here many times, and he's a gritty guy. You know, he comes into this race. There's my mom. <laughs> so how about this? We saw the numbers there. Uh, the last two years, he started 14th and 21st. Today is 19th. I just ask you straight up, can he do it realistically? Oh, of course he can. Let's not forget, last year he came in and won this race. Okay, guy, a couple guys crashed in the first corner, but he was there. Let's not forget he was on a nine-month layoff with, an, with injuries yeah. from Indianapolis. He had to fight and fight and fight just to get back here, and then comes out of the box with a win. So he's a guy that can win from anywhere in the field. He's going to play the strategy game, and he'll be a factor. Another guy who might be a factor as well is the 24-year-old British driver, Jack Harvey for Maya Shank Racing. Great qualifying result in seventh. Terrific for the young driver, running a partial season again this year, a fighter just like Bourdais, but for a different reason. He came into this season 25 pounds lighter. That's not easy to do, and that's not just to improve his uh, the charming British figure. That equates to lap time. That's like free speed, at least a tenth of a second yeah, around here, sure. and it's going to make a difference. Jack Harvey demonstrating he'll do whatever it takes to win in the IndyCar Series. By the way, uh, remember, Sebastian Bourdais will show you that uh, when he sat down with Rutledge Wood a few weeks ago at spring training. We need to welcome in Robin Miller. He's going to tell us about a very special driver who was part of a pretty spectacular rookie crop. Right, Robin? Well, Lee, I'll tell you this. Stefan Johansson started talking about this kid, Felix Rosenquist, about six years ago, and he said, somebody better hire this guy because he's the real deal. He's 27 years old. He's already been in 10 different series, and we were just talking off camera. I think that versatility has had to help, help your IndyCar right, right off the bat. Yeah, it's, it's definitely helpful. I mean, this is a championship where you really need, uh, you know, you need to be good at everything. You have oval, street circuits, uh, road courses. It's it, it's always something different. I, I find also from session to session, it's very different. So you cannot just say like, okay, I'm good 
in practice one and just leave it because the guys will always catch up to you and you have to change your driving and the car. So yeah, I, I really find that helpful to, to have done all that stuff in the past. Okay. You won the Macau Grand Prix twice. You ran DTM, Formula 3, Formula 2, Formula E, which you won races and stuff. How did we get lucky enough to have you in IndyCar? Why didn't Formula 1 snap you up? Well, I, uh, I think there's more fun stuff to talk about, to be honest. I mean, Formula 1 is something that, you know, I think it's always a bit diff different. And I, I think in motorsport, in, in general, you need to have a bit of luck to get into the right place. You know, even if you have the talent, it, it, it takes a lot of stuff to come together until you're, you know, where you want to be. And I, I think I've been very lucky, you know, even with what you say, I think I'm very lucky to end up with a, with a top team in Chip Ganassi Racing and uh, driving the NTT Data Honda in, in uh, NTT IndyCar Series. You know, that's... Uh, that's just fantastic. So I, I could say I'm unlucky and very lucky at the same time, and I, I, I'm just loving to be here. It's been a dream for a long time. So, yeah, fantastic. All right, he starts third, Lee Diffie, and he has been in a rolling start before, so he's ready. And that's the thing we have to remind ourselves about. He starts third in his very first IndyCar race. Felix Rosenquist, you're going to hear us talk about him a lot. As the grid is packed, we're building closer to the start of the race. And yes, a year ago, the man who started from the pole position, Robert Wickens, he's here. And he spoke one-on-one -on -one with Kelly Stavis about his progress after that Pocono crash. Edging closer to the start of the 2019 NTT IndyCar Series. This is the Firestone Grand Prix of St. Petersburg on a beautiful day in Florida to get things going. And as excited as we are about today, we can't help but look in the rearview mirror. A year ago here at St. Pete, Robert Wickens was the headline story in his first qualifying session, won the pole position in the race, almost won it until a late race collision with two laps to go with Alexander Rossi took the Canadian out of the mix. He was a sensational performer in 2018. He had four podiums, came very close to winning some races and was at the time the lead rookie. However, we have very, very vivid and strong memories about that horrific crash that he suffered at Pocono Raceway almost some seven months ago. Since then, Robert continues to make significant progress in his rehabilitation. He wanted to be here at this race as part of his rehab and recovery to support his Arrow Schmidt Peterson teammates and he has done that. He was warmly received, he has been all weekend by the fans, but particularly his peers in the driver group and he was at this morning's driver meeting and he's also been on the Arrow Schmidt Peterson pit box. And over the past two weeks, Kelly Savas spent some time with Robert and Kelly, I know that was special for you. Yeah, Lee, it was really incredible to see firsthand the intense training and rehabilitation program that Robert Wickens goes through on a daily basis. Much of that he has shared on social media. His fiancée, Carly Woods, has been by his side every step of the way. And to be here in St. Petersburg was just one of many goals that Wickens has set for himself as he remains determined not just to walk again, but to race again. Finally, we see green here at Pocono. Look at Wickens on the outside making a move. Here comes the red machine, the Lucas Oil entry. Outside, 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 still there. Ugh. That was ugly. Robbie, are you okay? We breathe a collective sigh to hear that Robert Wickens was awake and alert while being transported to Lehigh Valley Hospitals. What was it like when the reality set in and you were, you know, awake enough to realize really your, your situation? I told my family um, to not expect any movement, any sensations, anything for the first six months of the injury. Hey everybody. Once I came to my senses, and started investigating this injury on what recovery looks like, I really had a hard time finding it. And I just had no idea what the recovery looked like. And when I entered rehab, I was convinced that rehab was just to get me walking and get me back home. I had no idea that like walking is like months, months, months down the road and you have to learn how to take care of yourself again. What has kind of the journey been like with the, the highs and and loads of stuff that not everyone gets to see. I got my first muscle flicker at, I think, five weeks after the accident. And like, 
that was like the happiest day of our lives. You know, Carly and I were both crying and like, it was like a little like muscle twitch and like that was it, you know? And, uh, and then from there, it just went further and further. Everyone is being so supportive and, and so positive and I'm also only posting the positive. So like, sometimes I'm just like, oh man, am I giving them like a false indication on actually how my recovery is going. You've shown your progress throughout these last six months. Why has it been important to you to share that? You know, it's it's such an emotional roller coaster. Physically, it's the hardest thing I've ever done, but mentally and emotionally, it's hands down, non-comparison. It's like tenfold the hardest thing I've ever done because just to try find positives every day when those days where you're just so angry with what happened, it's it's really hard to do. Well, obviously one of those, you know, the most positive influence is in your life is of course your fiance, Carly. And at that six month mark, you surprised her by standing up, you know, under your own weight and kind of almost dancing with her a little bit. What was that moment like for the two of you? One of my main goals is I need to be on my feet at my wedding. And that's really honestly almost what's driving me more than, than getting back to IndyCar. And it's not that far away, you know, I'm getting married in September. And, uh, you know, I think what I've been doing the last couple of days has really made me think that that's, that's gonna be a reality. I want to be the best spinal cord recovery in the history of spinal cord recovery. I want to be the fastest. I want to walk the most natural. I want to recover and get back to life the best that anyone has ever done. You know, long-term, you've talked about the goal of of getting back in an indie car, how often do you think about what it'd be like to to climb back aboard one of those? Every day. Yeah. Every single day, I think about what it's going to be like, and you know, that's it's it's all I know how to do. It's what I've I told my parents when I was 10 years old that I wanted to be a race car driver, and at the time, my parents kind of like humored me a little bit, and then they, you know, it's like me telling my parents I, I want to be an astronaut and I want to be the first person on the Mars you know it's like yeah okay it's like it's this unachievable thing but then you know worked hard did a lot of sacrifice and and and, and there I was and I'm too young to just give that up and I don't I don't care what I have to do I don't care how hard I have to work I'm gonna come back So behind me here is the timing stand for the five team. This is where Robbie has spent much of the weekend headset on. We expect him to be here again through the race. He made it very clear to me that he wants to continue to support this Aeroschmidt Peterson team in any way that he can. Now, one of his teammates and close friend, James Hinchcliffe, is standing by with Kevin. Yeah, we're all incredibly happy to have Robbie Wickens back at the racetrack. No one more than this man, his longtime friend. What's it mean to you have, have Robbie here supporting you? It's huge, man. I mean, more than anything, it's just getting to see the smile on his face, you know, seeing him back at the track around people that he hasn't seen in a while in an environment that he loves. Uh, it's so great he was able to be here and been long, hard days for him. He's been busy. They've been keeping him pretty busy, but, you know, we've had him in engineering meetings. We've had him on the timing stand, and he's still been a huge asset to us in that position as well, so it's been great. Yeah, he's not just here as a spectator. You've put him to work. Give me something specific. I watched one of your debriefs. This is real. No, it really is. I mean, one of the big things is him being able to stay on the stand and keep track of certain things that engineers aren't catching looking more at the driving side of things um, you know procedurally on getting tires prepped for qualifying laps things like that we've had a couple of little chats and i've been able to pick his brain the same way that i was able to you know all last year so for me it's been good i think for him it's been therapeutic and everybody in uh, in st pete's been really happy to see him have a good day today thanks very much james hinchcliffe won his very first indy car race here back in 2013 he starts ninth kev thanks very much you heard in that wiccan's feature there that robbie has set himself paul uh, some very lofty goals, but in the race car, he impressed us each and every time he got in there. But in life now, and in recovery, he continues to surprise us. Absolutely, and you know, from the outside, the life of a racing driver can look glitzy and glamorous, but when you're on the inside, towns, you know as well as I do, it's like it kind of can be lonely sometimes. All you think about is the race car, and all you think about is your training and five hours a day, and all you think about is how can I be better? Am I good enough? And you have to solely like laser focus on that all the time and robert's going to take that into this next step that he has to do 
to have a normal life and work towards getting back in a race car. You know, it's the first time I've seen that interview with, with Kelly, and it really hammers home what he's been through over the last six or seven months through rehabilitation and that process. That's very much a physical process. And here, as Paul said, alone in that process, here he comes to St. Petersburg, and I think mentally, emotionally, you heard it from Hinchcliffe right there, it's been very therapeutic because this is the stimulation. This is yeah. family. This is everything that his this life his has world. been about. Yeah. And it's so cool to see him smile and feel all the positive energy in this paddock. Everybody's supporting him. Just awesome to see him back. And he's kept us part of his story every every moment uh, through social media. So uh, we continue to follow the story of Robert Wickens' recovery. Packed grid, as you can see here in St. Pete. And the front row is occupied by the Team Penske Power duo of Will Power and Joseph Newgarden. We'll hear from them next. Such a beautiful location to get the NTT IndyCar season underway here in St. Petersburg, Florida. We're just about half an hour away from race start, the first of 17 events this year. There's the power duo, Will Power, Joseph Newgarden. They will start on the front row today. You know, talking of Roger Penske, Team Penske, the captain's drivers always seem to be there at the end of the season, and the current three have proven that over the last handful of years. It's all about teamwork, and what a team Roger Penske has assembled. This has been the moment that Will Power has waited for. He does it for Team Penske. Will Power is an IndyCar champion. Simon Pagano. This guy is a very diverse and complete racer. Simon Pagano is the 2016 IndyCar Series champion. Roger Penske showed the faith. Simon Pagano delivered. Joseph Newgarden really is living the dream. His first season, he's driving for Roger Penske. He's young, he's fast, he's brave. He's going to be the star of, of American racing for a long time to come. Joseph Newgarden is the 2017 IndyCar Series champion. Winning the championship for Roger Penske. It doesn't get any better. Well, we know how important the Indy 500 is to Roger Penske, but that championship means a lot, too, as we heard Lee mention. Both of these guys have delivered in that category. Will, you're on the poll today, but I want to talk about being a two-time St. Pete winner. It's been a rough beginning race, beginning race of the season for you the last couple of years. How critical is it to win this race, and how different does that make your year? I mean, it's uh, obviously it would be fantastic to win it, and that's what we're pushing for. If you've got a chance to win, you've got to go for it. If we're not in that position, is to get the points. I mean, that has been the issue here the last few years. So very determined to have a good day and a good start to the season. Your teammate, Joseph Newgarden, starts right beside you. So we, we talked in the offseason about the effort at Team Penske to get better at the street courses. Obviously, it worked in qualifying. You start 1-2. Will that transfer to the race today? Well, we hope so. Uh, we don't fully know, but I, I think our cars are very fast now. You know, the, the natural speed in the car from yesterday was really good, and that seemed to still be there this morning. So we need to take care of each other. We need to try and get through that first phase of the race, which can always be a little crazy. Um, you know, everyone's excited to get going again, but um, I'm, I'm excited. You know, Team Chevy has done their homework. They've given us a great product, and uh, the Hitachi car, like I said, feels fast. So we'll see what we got. Is there a little pressure on the IndyCar team, guys? Because the V8 Supercar team's won the first two races of the year. NASCAR's won the last two races. I mean, you guys need to deliver. Oh, we got to step up, you know? I mean, <laughs> uh, every time we talk to Roger and, and, and Tim, I mean, we, we, uh, we're constantly telling them how great they're doing everywhere else. And we've been, we are a little bit behind on the IndyCar season starting out. So, yeah, the pressure's on. We got to deliver now. I tell you what, turn one is going to be interesting, Lee. Teammates starting side by side, and there's usually always some action down there on lap one, turn one at St. Pete. Well, Marty, we were talking about that before coming on the air. Townsend, um, both these guys are unapologetic about the way they drive. They're aggressive drivers. They want to get results. They're both winners. They're both champions. Will Powers had his moments with his teammates over the years. Pagano, Montoya, not really, not necessarily so with Elio Castro Neves. Are we about to maybe see a little bit of scrapping going on between these two? It's totally possible. Remember, Power, a, a champion for Team Penske, Newgarden a champion, neither of them a champion last year. So you know on that team, Paul, you know be better than anyone, it's time to step up. You heard it from Newgarden. I thought it was funny. Newgarden kind of laughing, having fun. I saw Will Power just staring <laughs> at Newgarden. And I'll bet he's thinking, don't come anywhere near the me eyes, in turn one. The eyes, those <laughs> eyes. What do you think, PT? Uh, I, don't, I don't foresee any drama in the first corner. I, I know from my own past experience with Roger, you're well coached when your teammate, you're one, two on the grid, that you get a good start away, protect yourselves, and get through the first corner and go racing. 
and more about Team Penske. By the way, in the off-season, Roger got inducted into the NASCAR Hall of Fame, but Penske has had an amazing run as far as the streets of St. Petersburg is concerned. Penske drivers have won six of the last ten races. That's how much the captain has celebrated here in St. Pete. This place has been special. Elio uh, has won multiple times. Will Power has won twice. Yeah, so we'll see what happens today. JPM won. Pablo Montoya had a couple of wins back-to-back, -to -back, in fact, 2015 and 2016. When we come back, we will uh, talk about and hear about guys who will fight those Penske drivers. The likes of five-time and defending champion Scott Dixon and Alexander Rossi. That's next. Gear up and get ready to go racing because we're not far away from the green flag flying here in St. Petersburg for the Firestone Grand Prix of St. Pete where you will see five-time and defending champion Scott Dixon race. He's also got a busy time. He's racing at the 12 Hours of Sebring next week. But one big item for Scott Dixon this year is to actually defend a title. He hasn't done that with any of the previous four, and that's a real thorn in his side. But one thing you may remember he did accomplish last, week, last year was joining AJ Foyt to become the only two-time, uh, sorry, five, the only two five-time IndyCar champions. The champion for 2003 is Scott Dixon. Dixon with Elio and Briscoe. Who's going to win the race? He gets him right at the strike. He wins the race and the championship. Scott Dixon is your champion. Dixon does it for the third time in his career. Well, I guess the five-year thing did, did, uh, <laughs> did play out. I just, I still can't believe that we've actually won the championship. This is fantastic. Scott Dixon not only wins in Sonoma, but wins the 2015 championship. Thank you guys, thank you so much for everything. Damn it man, I can't believe it. <laughs> Scott Dixon, he always delivers. Scott Dixon is on the verge of something truly special and significant. Something that hasn't been done in 51 years. Scott Dixon is a five-time IndyCar champion. Well, and the team got their championship rings on Tuesday of this week. Over 100 of those rings went out. So, Scott, we heard Lee mention a moment ago, never been able to win back-to-back -back titles. So what's the hardest thing about defending a title that maybe folks at home aren't thinking about? Yeah, I don't know. Like, I think that, you know, a lot of times, especially in, you know, any sport, you've got to be careful of uh, complacency. But, you know, I know this team, uh, they've won many a championships, and that's never been, you know, a problem. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't know why we've missed on following years. We've come, you know, very close and, and maybe missed out by a couple of points. So I think we're definitely capable of doing it. And that's goal number one is to try and, you know, take this PNC uh, bank number nine straight back to that championship title, uh, go for number six, chasing six, and see what we can pull off. So you described qualifying yesterday as Christmas because you had a, you had your hands full with the car itself. You were able to make the fire zone fast six because of a penalty. Is it more sorted for race day today? I think it was Christmas for the whole team. You know, Felix had the same issue in uh, qualifying two where he wasn't in. And, uh, you know, I think Herder got bumped and, and put him in. So hopefully we didn't use all of our luck. I, you know, hit the wall. We changed the car. It, it was just a bit of a mess of a, of a qualifying for us as a whole. You know, probably, uh, you know, for Felix's first run at it, you know, uh, he did a hell of a job. It was great to see the 10, you know, up there fighting hard. And, you know, uh, as we can see, you know, Pinsky front row, we're second row with Ganassi cars and Andretti there on the third row. So it's definitely going to be an interesting start, to say the least. Well, Scott would love to win the sixth championship, but he knows to do so. He might have to go through Alexander Rossi. Alexander Rossi, this quiet Californian, likes to do his talking on the track. They bang wheels, and Alexander Rossi spins Robin Wickens into turn number one. I don't think it was ill-advised. I had to run, but he just kept moving me into the marble. Very aggressive, just driving the car wherever he wants. That's an incredible mixture of talent and just raw courage. Rossi with the move of the race. Alexander Rossi made some moves that I have never seen in my life. Being very precise with every decision, but being bold. I love the way he drives. Look at Wickens trying to challenge oh. Rossi. Rossi having none of that. Side by side. Oh, side contact. Rossi. We want the elbows out a little bit. Don't hate the game, play the game. And last year was Alexander Rossi's first chance to legitimately fight for the championship that almost got there. So what did you learn last year that might help you this year in the title fight? Um, just turning 11th into 5th. And it's really when we look back at, at uh, the, the championship and the points compared to Scott and um, 
where it got away from us was kind of three races that uh, we can highlight. Some of them were out of our control. Others we, we definitely could have had an in impact on. So uh, it's really hard to win races in the NTT IndyCar Series, and it's uh, even harder to win championships. So we'll just try and improve uh, the, the weaknesses we had last year and, and obviously keep the strengths. You said after qualifying yesterday, considering how the weekend was going, you felt pretty fortunate to make the Firestone Fast 6. What kind of race car do you have? We have a really good car. Uh, the 27 Nap Auto Parts Honda is, uh, is strong. We found our issue overnight, um, and, and really for the first time this weekend, uh, the car felt something like something I was comfortable with in the warm-up. So I feel like we have a really good race car underneath us, so it's uh, just really about managing uh, lap one and uh, settling into a rhythm. The tire wear um, is going to be interesting, really on the alternate and the primary tires, and it's a little bit of an unknown for all of us. So it's uh, definitely going to be a learning uh, and feeling out kind of situation for the first 20 laps or so. Well, Lee, remember how strong Alexander Rossi was here last year. Watch for him again today, starting fourth. There's no question that Alexander Rossi dazzled us all last year and came so close to winning that championship. Paul, what can we expect from Rossi this year? I think everything exactly the same. He drives with anger, he drives with aggression, and he's upset at losing the championship last year. So watch for him today to come out fire in both guns. T-Bell, how about Dixon? Well, I think for Scott Dixon, he lives rent-free in Alexander Rossi's head. We saw that at the end of the season. So I think Rossi's got to purge that out of his thoughts all year long. Dixon always has that little smirk as a five-time champion should. So it should be a heck of a battle. It starts right here. And we're talking about champions and runners-up, and we've got a great field of rookies as well. There is so much to look forward to in this 2019 NTT IndyCar season. And whenever you get asked to sit down with Rutledge Wood, you know that it's going to be entertaining. Well, that's what happened recently for this man here, the two-time and defending race winner, Sebastian Bourdais. And you'll see that when we come back. You'll also see Coach Dungey. Yes, Tony is here doing the two-seater ride with Mario, and he'll give the command. All right, you mind holding that up a little bit and let him, uh... Yes, Magic, are you ready? <laughs> Hit it. Sebastian Bourdais, driver the number 18, Honda CL Master for Dale Coin Racing, Vaster, and Sullivan. Yeah. Try that again. It's, it's a long thing to spit. The world's foremost proving grounds for all sports cars is the annual race at Le Mans, France, the Kentucky Derby of the sports car world. You grew up in Le Mans, is that right? Yep. Was racing always something that you thought one day this is what I'm going to do because it was it was so prevalent around there? Or how did that happen? No, no, you'd be surprised. I never really spent any kind of energy projecting myself at being like, oh well, man, you know, that that's what I'm going to do. I just I felt very lucky to have motorcycles and ATVs and go karts. I was three years old. My dad had just bought me a, a PW50 Yamaha, and he took the thing out of the back of the car and just put me on the thing and told me, well, you know which way to go. There's only one road, so here you go. You know the way. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I was going uh, 40 k's an hour, 50 k's an hour. I was three years old. My mom was not impressed, by the way. Checkered flag for St. Petersburg resident Sebastian Bourdais. He lives just a few miles from the race course. A great race car. Crowd. Crowd there, bud. Nicely done today. So you won at St. Pete the last two years. Does that make it a more special place to win because you call that home? Yeah, and it had eluded us for a long time, too. I was on pole the very first time in 03. 11, I crashed the car in the warm-up and the thing caught on fire, and so it didn't race. And then 17, you know, I crashed the car and qualify on, on the first lap. And then, you know, you start last, you're like, man, you know, what are we going to do from last? But then, you know, you put the helmet on and, and then you put the visor down and, and you make sure that if you're going to be out there, it's not going to be meaningless. And you end up winning. Last the first, Ed. Nice job. Last the first. Great job. Exercise the demon in 2003. And then last year, it was very special for different reasons. My first win since the crash in Indy. Getting to do that in front of friends and family and the community, it was really emotional. I just feel very lucky that, you know, I get paid to do what I love. You just chase it all your life, pretty much. 
Uh, we always joke that the local driver is responsible for the weather at their home racetrack. So I think we all collectively owe Sebastian Bourdais a big thank you. 82 degrees, stunning weather for the IndyCar opener here in 2019. It's been a surprising weekend, and this race always provides surprises at the end. Remember last year, will we expect that today? Let's get it all kicked off. It's time for pre-race ceremonies. Race fans, at this time, please rise and remove your hats as the U.S. Central Command Color Guard presents our nation's colors. Please remain standing as Reverend Lewis Murphy from Mount Zion Progressive Missionary Baptist Church offers this afternoon's invocation, followed by the national anthem performed by Chicago Blackhawks national anthem singer and voice of back home again in Indiana at the Indianapolis 500, Jim Cornelison. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, creator of the heavens and earth, creator of all mankind. We thank you for this beautiful, sunny day in St. Petersburg, Florida. Truly, you have been so wonderful and gracious to us. We thank you for our elected officials. We thank you for the owners and organizers of the Grand Prix. We are praying for your blessing your safety for the drivers, those that will be serving in the crew pit. Keep our fans safe. We're just so thankful for all that you continue to do for us. In your holy name we pray, amen. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light oh, what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we wash were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh Always an A-plus with Jim Cornelius and singing the national anthem. Look who I've found, uh, Football Night in America fame and also Super Bowl and Hall of Fame fame as well. Tony Dungy, you're going in a two-seater ride with Mario Andretti. Aren't you the guy that wrote number two on the board to your team every year? <laughs> Don't go over 70 miles an hour? Come on. That was my uh, advice to them, so I'm going to break my own rule today, but I'm in good hands. I talked to Mario before. I said, are you going to keep me safe? He said, no, I'm going to keep me safe, so <laughs> I feel good. If he's keeping you safe, you're yeah. safe, and could you imagine going with a better guy than Mario Andretti? No, and this is a big thrill for me. Of all the time I lived in Indianapolis, we never met, so to be able to just shake hands with a legend and somebody who was the best at what he did, it's pretty awesome. 
You and I were talking about the emotion just seeing this place. Is it surprising to you, the, the crowd and the atmosphere and the electricity here? It is, uh, and being here on race day, I've been to practices and I've been to events uh, at the Speedway in Indianapolis, but never on race day, and, and to have the crowd and the energy, it's fantastic. All right, have you been practicing driver starting your engines in the mirror? I actually have. <laughs> I want to be good, and I don't want to mess that up. I've got one line, one thing to do, i got to deliver. Don't worry, the pace car's only wrecked a couple of times. You'll be fine. I have I've researched that. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I know he researched that. Tony Dungy going to be in the two-seater today. Can't wait for that. We're ready to kick off the 2019 season. It's coming up next with Gentlemen Start Your Engines. Can't wait to get it underway on a beautiful day here in St. Pete. We all have a few screws loose to race at 240 miles an hour, inches apart from each other. Race car drivers know the dangers of the sport, but they don't really care. What the hell happened? You're fighting over hundreds or thousands of a second. We've all won at every step of the way. What differentiates you from the rest? You live for putting the thing on the edge and trying to get more out of it. Dixon is a five-time IndyCar champion. You only get such a short window, and I want to try and win as many championships as possible. Something that hasn't been done in more than half a century. No career is complete without a championship. Go, 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 overtake, overtake. You have to be good at super speedway, short ovals, high bank, road tracks, street courses. Sebastian Bourdais goes back to back on the streets of St. Petersburg. You gotta be complete as a driver, and there's no greater challenge than that. It's time to go racing. It's time to bring the action in the NTT IndyCar Series for 2019. It's the season opener, and we welcome you to NBC Sports coverage of the Firestone Grand Prix of St. Petersburg. It's round one of 17 on a beautiful day in Florida. 24 cars, 24 drivers, all wanting that maiden victory of the year. And a really nice crowd on hand. Marty mentioned it a little earlier about the weather. It's broaching 80 degrees. It has been a wonderful week here in Florida and the weekend has been just perfect. Yes, it's warm, but it's nice. Weather, threatening weather, nowhere to be seen. So it is all good, it's all green for the beginning of the season. Let's head down to pit lane and kick things off with Marty Snyder. Marty? Hey Lee, Team Pinsky had one goal in the offseason. They had a December meeting where they said, we have to get better at the street courses. Well, St. Pete is a street course. And guess what, Team Pinsky, even though they struggled Friday and a little bit on Saturday, they locked out the front row with Will Power winning the pole and Joseph Newgarden starting outside of him. Can they finish 1-2 -two today though? That's what they would love to do. Kevin? Well, right behind Team Penske, it's Chip Ganassi racing, starting in the second row. We already know Scott Dixon is a legend, a five-time champion. Only AJ and Mario have won more races, but now he's got support. Felix Rosenquist, no one has finished higher than seventh as a teammate since Dario Franchitti retired, but Rosenquist has met early expectations. He actually out-qualified Dixon yesterday. He's going to start third, and he might be ready to win, not just support his teammate, Kelly. Andretti Autosport finished an incredible one, two, three, four at this race back in 2005. They've got a strong four car lineup again today. Headlined by Ryan Hunter Ray, who showed top three speed in every practice session this weekend. He lines up fifth, just ahead of teammate Alexander Rossi. Zach Veach and Marco Andretti round out that team's lineup. Robin? Well, the good thing about the IndyCar series, Kelly, it's competitive as hell. The second best thing, lots of different people can win. Well, let's be realistic. Andretti, Ganassi, and Penske win most of the championships and most of the races. But there's one team that thinks they can challenge, Sam Schmidt and Rick Peterson. They've had Arrow as their sponsor the last few years. Now Arrow is their co-owner. Arrow's got a lot of money. They want this team to make the next step. you got James Hinchcliffe. They've won seven races in the last three or four years. So guess what? Maybe we'll have a big four someday, Lee Diffie. They're looking for it. That's the goal, Robin, for sure. So Hinch knows what it's like to drive to victory lane here. We'll see if he can do it again today with his new teammate, Marcus Ericsson. Two Swedish drivers in the championship this year, and both of them rookies. So Ericsson and Felix Rosenquist. So there's something quite new. Not many Swedish drivers have been in IndyCar over the years, and two of them here in the series for 2019. There in the Gainbridge Honda is Zach Beach. It's been a scrappy weekend 
for the driver from Ohio. He's looking to clean it up in the race and come away with a good result. He had a really promising and satisfying rookie season last year. Now it's time to take that next logical step up, but it is going to be tough here. So everybody assembled, all the talk stops now, but there are some very important words to be spoken from two-time Super Bowl winner, one as a player, one as a coach. Here is Tony Dungy for the command. The wait is finally over. It all starts here. Time to kick off the 2019 NTT IndyCar season. St. Petersburg race fans, are you ready? It's time for those most famous words in all of sports. Here to give the command, please welcome today's Grand Marshal, Pro Football Hall of Fame head coach, NBC Football Night in America analyst, and former head coach of your Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Tony Dungy. Drivers, start your engines. Tony wasn't wasting any time there. He wants to go for that two-seater ride with Mario Andretti. He looked a little conflicted there. <laughs> uh, a bit like my face when I went skydiving for the first time. He's not sure if this is a good idea. Got to hurry up and get that helmet on, get those earplugs in, and get that ride from Mario. I, I think what's a really uh, satisfying thing is to see somebody as famous and successful and as accomplished as Tony Dungy is and just how thrilled he is to have met Mario Andretti, let alone go for a ride with him. And now, now Tony realizes the full gravity of the situation here. They're quickly trying to buckle up the helmet, get the radio plugged in. And Mario, cool as a cucumber, as always, up front. And when we bring you the 103rd running of the Indianapolis 500 this year, uh, in the lead up to the Grand Prix of Indianapolis, of course, the uh, the previous event uh, to the 500, uh, there was a special documentary, Drive Like Andretti, and it's, of course, in honor of celebrating Mario's 50th anniversary of winning the 1969 Indy 500. Look forward to that. So everything looking good with the Honda two-seater, and Mario just eases away along with NBC's own Tony Dungy. And we're going to see if we can connect with Tony now. Tony, it's Lee Diffie in the NBC Sports IndyCar booth. Can you hear me? Hi, Tony. It's Lee Diffie in the NBC Sports booth. Can you hear me? So it's a little tough to hear in there. We might just uh, ease back and let and let uh, Tony enjoy the ride. Enjoy a really special wow. ride. And by the way, next uh, in two weeks' time at Circuit of the Americas in Austin, Texas, three-time wow. Indianapolis 500 winner Elio Castro Neves will be driving the two-seater. Now, for the first time, we've heard Tony. Hey, Tony, going to try again. It's Lee Diffie in the NBC Sports booth. Can you hear me? I just heard him say, "Wow." <laughs> that, that'll do. <laughs> I'm going to say speechless. <laughs> I'm going to say speechless. having a great ride so that's good hope Tony's enjoying it Mario will certainly give him a great ride and meanwhile let's take a look at how they will line up today for 110 laps with the Firestone starting grid and for the 55th time in his career will power on the pole the pecking order of power players is all at the front of the grid we got team Penske on the first row followed by Ganassi on the second row. Watch out for this action. Felix Rosenquist has shown up with authority for his rookie race here in the IndyCar Series, out qualifying Scott Dixon, but these two gunners are gonna come from behind. So it's all Penske, followed by all Ganassi, followed by all Andretti Autosport with Ryan hunter Ray and Alexander Rossi on the third row of the grid. Big hats off to Jack Harvey in his first, uh, well, it's not quite a full season, it's a 10 race season, but Maya Shank Racing to qualify seventh was outstanding. Colton Herter disappointed yesterday. He made a small mistake 
held up a car, but watch out for him in the race. And then there's Simon Pagano was really frustrated that he didn't even get a lap in qualifying. His words were very straightforward and simple, Townsend. He said, we didn't even get to play. How about this guy? Marco Andretti didn't even turn a single lap. He ran out of fuel because the fuel line wasn't connected on his outlap for qualifying. Marco Andretti very fast this weekend in practice. He's going to be on a charge. Qualifying yesterday was quite strange. You know, in the three phases of qualifying, in the first phase, the first segment, there's two groups. Group one had multiple red flags, and uh, a lot of drivers were hurt and hindered by that, not being able to actually get out there and turn a time. So let's take a closer look at this street course. Well, Dip, it all starts down in turn one with the big funnel effect, that super wide airport runway. You can go six, seven cars wide, but by the time you get to turn two, it's a car and a half, maybe. You wind to the backside over to turn 10. Heavy braking as you come on to Dan Weldon Way. You go through those S turns, 11, 12, and then the final corner, 180 degrees. And as I said, Paul, this is where the passing happens. Yeah, this is a bit of a sucker hole here, guys. It's super wide, and guys are going to dive down the inside. You got paint lines, really easy to lock up. But here's another spot. If you get off a, a good runoff turn three, you can get a nice shot down the inside at turn four. Next opportunity on the back straight. It's got a little bit of a kink there. It's actually more than a little bit. It feels like a real corner. You're pretty heavily loaded as you come to the break zone. Try to get inside somebody in 10, but if you're outside, it's trouble. Let's walk you through the various views that we will enjoy uh, throughout the course of today's season opener here in St. Pete. And this is we'll get to look at thanks to Gallagher aboard the Carlin Chevrolet the 59 machine with Max Chilton David Yerman Honda belonging to Santino Ferrucci will give us this view he's carrying the uh, helmet cam as well as a bonus for the young American driver Gainbridge supplies this view and that is for Zach Veach we spoke about the Andretti Autosport driver earlier and Graham Rahal and the United Rentals on board has this view these these uh, perspectives gives us so much and how busy they are the drivers are around these street courses hinch james hinchcliffe uh, we spoke about him before this is the lucas oil view for the arrow schmidt peterson machine and we've got more to bring you as well plenty in at auto nation and alexander rossi and his teammate at andretti autosport rhr ryan hunter ray up ahead and his camera also brought to us by auto nation as well determination personified right here captain america wants to get it done here in his home state and then you've got the ntt data car for chip ganassi racing felix rosenquist you will hear us talk about the 27 year old swedish driver many many times so a new principal sponsor in ntt you've got new drivers you've got new teams and it is a new season there is a lot to cheer about in indycar racing 2019 that's for sure it's an all penske front row once they get into that start zone will power has the power he dictates how the field will start and he's gone power takes off scott dixon's looking for a way through on new and he can't hunter ray on the inside of rosenquist power's taken off and the rookie slides into second big jump by hunter ray trying to get down the inside he got pitched off by dixon but everybody gets through turn one clean as they run down the back straightaway. Alexander Rossi backed off a little bit in one, but then challenged his teammate Hunter Ray. So Rossi is up to fifth, Hunter Ray back to sixth, and they're clean all the way through turn four. Rosenquist up to P2. He's made a move on, on the Penske car and has moved his way into P2. Big traffic back here. You saw that pink Auto Nation Honda for Maya Shank Racing of Jack Harvey. He was forceful with Charlie Kimball. There he is, tucked in behind Ryan Hunter Ray. Then Kimball, then Graham Rahal, Hinchcliffe, Pagano. And then the Ed Carpenter cars are in the mix as well. But it's Will Power, the two time winner here on the streets of St. Petersburg, who gets a clean, clear start and has taken off. Watching Rosenquist, Paul, you mentioned it. What a start for the rookie taking new garden in the opening few corners and now opening up a really nice gap to new garden there you see rosenquist in the blue car and here comes dixon on new garden talk about a start as i'm looking at the timing board andretti up to 14th from the back of the grid let's take you back to the start and ryan hunter right is there contact with rosenquist there oh, sure is sure was yeah he had to back it off right there and then dixon turned in on him right here he had to shut it down and rossi came around the outside body and he came on the radio right after that and kind of apologized to his team they said that's okay he said it got bottled up on the inside i had no choice but to back off but ryan hunter
these front wings Six. so much tougher than they were a couple of years ago. You can you can stand to rub a little bit now that we're at a unified arrow kit. Yeah. It used to be that that stuff would go ripping off like balsa wood. Jack Harvey held his position on the start. He's sitting in P7 right behind Hunter Ray. He needs to just sit there and ride and learn off these guys and get a good result. Meanwhile, for two-time and defending winner Sebastian Bourdais, he's gone backwards. He's lost a spot, 19th to 20th. And look at Felix Rosenquist in that blue NTT data Honda for Chip Ganassi Racing. He has caught ground on Will Power. And the big mover in the pack, Ed Jones for Ed Carpenter Racing. Ed Jones in the first race for that new partnership with ECR and Scuderia Corsa, the Italian Ferrari team in GT Racing. They've been thrilled with that partnership, and this is a great start to the race. He's made up three positions from the start. Takuma Sato has made up four, so a couple of big movers in the pack. Meanwhile, up front, Will Power, Felix Rosenquist. Rosenquist now catching the back of Power. Power is a master of saving fuel. Rosenquist has been driving cars with no fuel, a Formula E, so he's got to learn how to save fuel. And Kevin, he is challenging Will Power. Actually, on that point, Paul Barry Wanzer, who is one of the strategists and team managers, said he knows how to save energy. Saving energy is actually harder than saving fuel, so he has experience at that. Coming into this race, he said, I know the golden rule, and it's don't make contact with your teammates. So really, I expected him, if Dixon challenged at all, let him go. But this shows how bold, how fast and aggressive Felix Rosenquist can be. He's off to a great start as a 27-year-old IndyCar rookie with a lot of experience. It's Penske in power. Rosenquist and Ganassi, one and two. Beautiful view overhead. Just showing again the Ganassi car starting to come up on that Team Penske Chevrolet of Will Power. Here's Newgarden, then Scott Dixon, Alexander Rossi, Ryan Hunter Ray. Pulling away from Newgarden a little bit. They've got about a second gap. As we slide back to Ray Hall here and Hinchcliffe having a nice little battle. Andretti is right there with Herta. Ed Jones, you'll see, you saw the flex box rear wing there of the Ed Carpenter Racing Chevrolet. Jones has now added another one to his list. That means he's made up four positions from the start. He's right behind these guys here in Graham Ray Hall, who's starting to challenge Charlie Kimball and defend from James Hinchcliffe. And Ed Jones tucked in right behind. All right, leader is doing 62 7. Tough guy to pass, Kimball. He's really hard. He's a late breaker. But. Doesn't necessarily like to look in his mirror sometime either. I know Graham and Charlie have had a few run-ins through the years. But for all of these drivers on the softer red compound, I think it's the first race we've ever had in the era of multiple compound choice that everybody's opted to start on the soft tire. And that's because they think every team thinks these tires are going to go away pretty quick here. So so get rid of them early, do it. Get, get rid, rid of, of them early, yeah. but you need to get a stint in, maybe even a short stint, but you have to protect the rear tires, especially on the power down to get through that first stint, Marty. Yeah, Townsend, first time ever, everyone selected the red tire, as you mentioned. We'll see pit stops as early as lap 12 or lap 15. And you're right, the majority of the field going to that primary tire, but guys in the back like Simon Pagina, who didn't even make it out of round one in qualifying. There you see him flash through in the yellow Menards car. They have three sets of sticker tires. He told me, I want to use that to my advantage today. So we're going to go alternate from everybody else, but most of the field going with those primary tires, and we'll see stops early and often at St. Pete. What a start. Good clean start, quick pace. Rookie challenging the reigning Indy 500 champion. It's all happening here in St. Petersburg, Florida. And as we said earlier, a great crowd to witness this season opener. Round one, race one of 17. You've got a Hall of Fame football star here. Robbie Wickens is here. What a weekend in St. Pete. Quick reminder that you can get even more IndyCar with the new NBC Sports Gold IndyCar Pass. Watch every qualifying and practice live and on demand by visiting NBCSports.com slash IndyCar right now. And we know that many of you have uh, taken advantage of that already. We've had a fun weekend bringing you all the practice sessions. We even got PT out of bed early this morning to do the morning warm-up. As you look at Will Power in the silver Chevrolet ahead for Team Penske, ahead of Ganassi's rookie, Felix Rosenquist. What a start to his IndyCar career. Unbelievable. It's been a long time, Townsend, since we've seen
this number 10 running up front. Last guy was really Dario, and it's been a bit of a struggle for Chip to have a really top flight two-man team, and this kid is sensational. Well, remember, Ganassi sort of deviated from their long-standing practice of a two-car team. They went to a four-car team. That didn't work out as well results-wise, and now I think they're fully realizing the benefit, Kevin, of getting back to two cars. So we've already seen stoppers. Marcus Erickson was the first to come in on lap seven. This is to Kumasano, front wing change. Remember, he's been fast all weekend, but a penalty in qualifying put it back, Kelly. And this is the rookie Santino Ferrucci. He brought out a red flag during qualifying, so he started from the rear. A little bit of a slow stop there. You see, they've also put the primary uh, tires on this rookie driver. Yeah, qualifying did not go to plan for the youngster from Connecticut, who we saw last year. He made an impressive start to his IndyCar career. This is his first full season and one of five rookies in this year's championship. And here's the problem. There goes Ferrucci on cold tires, full fuel, and the leader power is just coming through turn one, turn two now. So we'll have to see if this starts to play a factor with lap traffic. There's power. They're about five to six seconds back, so we'll see what happens. And Kevin mentioned about Marcus Erickson of Arrow Schmidt peterson uh, pitting early with a new set of tires on. Erickson has just sent the fastest lap of the race. Kel? And Spencer Piggott also getting called to pit road. As you see there, that's the force of Mateus Lane. He also has, uh, had some strong moments in practice he and teammate Tony Kanan going two totally different directions throughout these practices trying to find something that will work for both of them they've got some work to do as neither of them uh, had a particularly strong qualifying effort back at the front will power he boasts just over a one-second lead over Felix Rosenquist. Third is Joseph Newgarden, then Scott Dixon. Starting to ease out, isn't it? The gaps in between these top ten runners. A larger gap from Hunter Ray back to Jack Harvey. Then Charlie Kimball, who's only doing five races this year in the Trasiba Chevrolet for Carlin Racing. One of those five will be the big one, the 103rd running of the Indy 500. And here's Marco Andretti. Troublesome qualifying yesterday left him at the back, Kev. Yeah, they couldn't get any fuel. The fuel intake was a problem, so we think he might be quick. He's been quick in a couple of practices. Going into the primary Firestones, front wing change, and Marco Andretti is back out. Marco's big news for this year is that he's got a new race engineer as we watch Bordet exit. Mark Bryant is Andretti's new engineer, and Mark Bryant formally engineered Pato O'Ward to his victory to become a champion in the Indy Lights series. There you see Sebastian Bordet coming right out of the pits as well, a lot like last year when Bordet won from the back. They pitted him early, get off strategy, see if you get lucky, to a, lucky from a yellow and cycle to the front. But it's going to be a long day of, of pit stops for sure with the tire wear right now. We basically split the field on strategy. We've got half the cars from 14th down. Andretti was running 13th, 14th at the time. So he was really the last guy to come in. Maybe Veach will come next or Herta, but half the field is split. And here's Ray Hall coming in early, and he was more towards the front. So I'm not sure too many want to go too long on these reds. We've heard maybe even as soon as 11 laps, they're really starting to lose life. And everyone started on sticker reds except Joseph Newgarden. And Graham Rahal was uh -oh. in that group. And we've got a yellow. Bourdais is in the wall. And he is out. It is over. There will be no three-peat for Sebastian Bourdais. A lot of smoke there. It might not have been in the wall. It might have an engine problem. There was smoke coming from the rear. There was a rear shot of the carpool heading up towards turn 10, and you saw some flames on the right-hand side of the Sealmaster entry for Dale Coyne Racing with Vassa Sullivan. It's over. The dream of having the three-peat at home here in St. Pete is done for Sebastian Bourdais as Will Power dives for pit lane. Must have been worried about a full course caution might come out with that car in the runoff. So they're taking the opportunity not to get hung out on the yellow. But yeah, taking advantage of that actually, PT. So here's Will Power coming down pit road. The leader, Roger Pinsky, really kind of telling him to mine the gap more than anything else. It's going to be scuffed primary tires for Will Power, hoping to take advantage. And so far, we're still green, guys. They're hoping that a caution will come out and they can jump the rest of the field. Kyle Novak. Also, Simon Pagano on pit road as well, guys. Kyle Novak, the race director, told us in our meeting with him that he's going to do everything he can to try to stay green if somebody's safely in the runoff area. So that's the situation with Bourdais, and it was a very late decision from Will Power. Yeah, it was. Wow, that was like, come in, 
very, very late call through the grass. So they must have thought that they were going to have a problem with board A. Engine goes away, big fire, and he pulls off into a safe spot. They won't go yellow down there. So I don't know if that was a good call for Roger to bail off and call him in. And that's a pretty big failure on the right-hand side of Bourdais' car. No yellow for there. They'll just drag that car right there behind the wall. So I don't know if that was a good call by the Penske team to well, call Will in that late. But they're in the fuel window, the pit stop window, excuse me. So, you know, they can make it to the end still on three more stops. Kevin? A big break for all these teams are pitting right now. James Hinchcliffe just came in a moment ago. He feared that he was going to be caught out by the caution. Ed Jones also making his debut for Ed Carpenter and Scuderia Corsa Racing in and out and on the primary Firestones. And what that does is it has given Felix Rosenquist in the NTT data car the lead of this race in his first ever IndyCar race. The challenge, though, for power of the Penske team is where did he slot back out? Is he in traffic? Is that going to start to slow his pace? Because Power was still comfortably in the 102s up front on the used reds. Now he's on blacks and on sticker well, blacks. He's got a nice clear run. He's all by himself. Hunter Ray is about 15 seconds up the road on him. Kanan is five seconds behind him. So he has got to put the hammer down right now. If he was in traffic, that would really hurt his overall race distance and time that he has to achieve. But right now, he's going to be going as quick as he can. Pretty amazing, though, pitted from the lead under green, and he still comes out in six. 20 seconds. He is 20 seconds behind race leader Felix Rosenquist. It's about 25 seconds, the pit lane delta, including the stop. And we'll have to keep an eye on Powers' lap time. That lap, 102.2, that's quicker than everybody in front of him. So this could play out well, Paul, with clean air and fresh tires for Will Power. Yeah, right now about seven-tenths quicker than the leader, and that's what he's going to have to do the rest of the race. He's committed now to not saving fuel and laying down qualifying laps. That's not the only yellow we're going to see today. We haven't had a yellow. It was a local <laughs> yellow. Yep. I think we're going to see multiple today. There was seven or eight last year from memory. So it was quite eventful. That's what this street course provides as we have a look at Felix Rosenquist, the race leader, first time IndyCar competitor. Here he is on pit lane. And he comes in and hits his marks going from the alternate Firestones to get Speedway Fuel, a new set of black Firestones. Solid first IndyCar pit stop for Felix Rosenquist. Where is Will Power? Through turn one, so no problem. Job done there for Will Power. And we'll look for Rosenquist in the background, and that is massive advantage to Will Power. Rosenquist was keeping him anywhere between six tenths of a second to one second within his reach and now power has got at least several seconds advantage and lee you talk about that delta of 25 seconds it's very small so that's a not a big penalty came out six and you talk about that gap he has that clean road that paul loves to have and now all the leaders are going to come down pit road this time so they pit it on the very front end of the window it does back them into the fact that they have to run a longer stint on this run but you know what they're not worried about it they're going to run as fast as they can a second and third place come down pit road right now joseph newgarden ryan hunter race scott dixon also coming down pit road as as well all of these guys going to primary tires and they asked ryan hunter ray can you run three more laps we would love for you to go three more laps he said it's not going to last that long will power has shot by so you see newgarden and then dixon hunter ray leaving pit road as well where will these guys blend out there goes power he's comfortably through turn three in the break zone and look at this rosenquist whoa and you got a new got an ahead of the ganassi driver for the time being but was short-lived big that move on the outside cold tires for newgarden and he tried to defend, but Rosen was, was at speed, had a lap on his tires already. You really need two or three corners to get temperature into the Firestones. Now Newgarden has that with Dixon behind, so Newgarden should be able to now comfortably slot into pace. And further back, there's Tony Kanan, who hasn't stopped. There's the A.J. Foyt driver driving the, the 14. Hasn't been a great weekend for them, but they've stayed out and work themselves into the top five for now. Marty, here comes Rossi. Yeah, the last of the leaders to come down pit road. And a good call by Rob Edwards here. Just going that one extra lap than everybody else. It's going to buy them some time on the back end. So maybe they can short fill on subsequent stops. The ready cars have really struggled on older red tires. They put the primary black sidewall firestones on. 
Alexander Rossi back on the racetrack. We'll see where he cycles in with the rest of the leaders. And Whoa. Comes out. Can't really tell who that was, but it was a big moment there as he chopped across the bow. It was Kanan. So Rossi comes out in sixth place just behind Kanan, who Kanan who's not pitted yet. There's Tony. There's Rossi. So Rossi comes back out in the same position he was in. So power boasts a four-second advantage over Felix Rosenquist and then Joseph Newgarden and Scott Dixon and Kennard running in that top five. Early stages of this 110-lap Firestone Grand Prix of St. Petersburg. Well, power came out and said, I was so regretful for the way that last year started. It was all my own fault, spinning, challenging Robert Wickens at turn two right about here a year ago. And he said, I put myself in that bad and poor oh. position. Problem for Ryan Hunter Ray. Another Honda. Another Honda's had an engine failure, same side. Turbo looks like it's gone away. He came and on the radio and said, yep, it's gone, guys. Meaning the engine, obviously, for Ryan Hunter Ray. And this is the one thing he said we could not have in 2019. They had all the poor finishes because of DNFs last year. Here they are, race one. Ryan Hunter Ray is going to be out early. And that is not good for Tony Kanan. There is the full course caution. Kanan was hanging on. Yeah. Big talk this weekend was that Honda still had an advantage power-wise over Chevy. But right now, they've got an unreliability problem. Two of the big favorites for this race out. Sebastian Bourdais, followed by Ryan Hunteray. He's got the worst luck, Hunteray, doesn't he? He does. He can't believe it. All the testing. And they didn't see any of these issues in the offseason. And not all weekend either. He's been one of the cars and one of the drivers to watch for the speed and consistency that Ryan Hunter Ray has had. So first full course caution of the day. Not one for Bourdais, but certainly one for RHR. So the field circulated at a slow pace. We'll catch a breath and they'll help clean up the 28 Honda for Andretti Autosport. Back at St. Petersburg, under caution here early in the Firestone Grand Prix of St. Petersburg. Ryan Hunter Ray with an engine failure. And before that, before we got the green, Coach Tony Dungy got to go out in the two-seater. So how was the experience, Coach? Unlike anything I've ever done. Uh, you know, Mario was telling me, oh, we're going to just ease into it and get going. And we are flying and going around these corners. And looks like we're six inches from the wall. And I'm just uh, amazed at, at the control that he had. And they do that with 20-plus cars on the track, too, and much higher speed as well. By the way, your kids tweeted out something while you were doing the two-seater ride because they were watching you tweet out. There you go, getting an up-close IndyCar experience. And they're having fun, too. They really did. We got the whole family over here. The hospitality was great. You know, we've always lived here, and we've yeah. known that the race was happening but never came to experience it firsthand, and it's been awesome. It really has. There you go. I think IndyCar has been calling him for a long time. Lives here in St. Pete. Obviously coached the Colts for a long time. Good to see you, Coach. All right, Kelly. Well, Marty, I told you Robert Wiggins wanted to stay involved here with the team at Aeroschmidt Peterson. You've had the headsets on. What have you observed here, and, and what is Hinch saying over the radio? He's pretty happy. I think the problem right now is his track position, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's hard to pass here, especially when people are kind of just using the button to defend themselves but I think he's got a good car he just has to try uh, you know make make it work in clean air but that's what everyone's trying to do in that kind of end of top 10 but you never know it's a long race you know it's a pity what happened with uh, with Hunter Ray there but I think it doesn't really change our strategy very much going green here Lee all right we are ready to go green and look at Felix Rosenquist he is all over the gearbox of Will Power he's not letting the reigning Indy 500 champion get away coming into that restart oh, zone Power out. gets sideways he got a good start Rosenquist he's look right the there he's making the move cautions can breed cautions Rosenquist oh, in the inside up but he gets it Power, wow. Power squares him up you won't go through there too abreast he's got him Felix Rosenquist making Power. his intentions clear. Down to turn four, Will Power will look for an inside line. Pokes his nose out. Oh, Is he going to go through with it? No. Woo. Almost.
Rosenquist gets his front wing chopped off by Rosenquist. What a move. What a terrific job by Rosenquist on the brakes in turn one to just keep that tire rolling after a little bit of lockup. That is the sign of an experienced and very talented Swede. He has done more than 10 series around the globe, both open wheel and sports car. He is an incredible driver. People have been talking about him for years, whether he was headed to Formula One or IndyCar. And here he is, and he's making his name for himself in America on day one. And he pulled off that move with patience right here in the final corner, coming to get the green flag. And uh oh, Power has a problem. Power might have a gearbox problem coming off the last corner because he didn't get off that corner well at all. And he's going to lose, oh, big brakes. Huge braking by Power into the turn one. I wonder if he didn't get all the way down to second gear. He might have been in third, perhaps, by accident coming off the final corner because the car accelerated just fine, but not initially. Hey, here's something we've said before, haven't we, fellas? Dixon and Rossi <laughs> together on track. Jack Harvey and then Graham Rahal, James Hinchcliffe and Ed Jones. Got to say, Jack Harvey doing a terrific job today, running in sixth place. Sister car with James Hinchcliffe just behind but Jack Harvey's been leading the charge Rosen that three car effort Rosenquist is checking out it looks like what power is just holding up the whole train and I'm wondering if anybody's heard anything in the pits if he has a gearbox problem or he not getting into second gear watch here coming off the last corner if he has another problem a little wide there Newgarden also wide at the apex I think both those Penske's struggling a little bit with the balance down there. Rosenquist is starting to streak away. He's got almost two seconds over Will Power to Newgarden. Dixon, Ray Hall thought about it on Jack Harvey there. And with the strength of Rosenquist, you have to look back to Dixon running in fourth. He's starting to challenge Newgarden. So Ganassi looks to be very strong. And let's take a look at the restart again here. Perfectly timed by Rosenquist. He just got the, a good exit popped out and then was deep on the brakes locks the inside tire releases the brakes runs a little bit wide right here you'll see the inside tire on the paint watch this bang on the brakes power squares them up tries to come and do the over under but there's no room to get through oh this is not good that is ed jones i believe in the number 20. Nope. Oh, and laced. laced. Maybe both of them are in the fence. Looks like they might have hooked wheels together. Laced back tire is up like they hooked front and, front and rear wheels together. We hope we can get a replay of that for you guys. In that corner, turn nine, leading onto the back straight. We've always seen issues there, Paul, where somebody jumps in mm -hmm. in that little short shoot between turns eight and nine. You can see there's been two cars in the wall there. There's marks. And sometimes what there. happens is somebody clips the inside wall with the right front. So we'll have to get a feel for what happened. And guys, in similar fashion, Matthias Leist went out on lap 28 of this race last year. <laughs> We've done 26. Let's have a look. Oh, that's it. That was a hard hit, and Leist just probably came around, clipped him. Yep. And what happened was clipping the right front. We've seen that with Tony Kanaan in previous years here. If you just get it millimeter wrong on the turn in, watch this. You break the right front steering arm and you are a passenger at that point. You can see the mark on his tire right there. There's a white mark on the tire. So he clipped the inside wall and it just shot him. Boom, right, you can't even turn the car and you go right in. Watch how close Zach Veach comes to hitting him. Wait for it, wait for it. This is Veach, watch this. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> no. Oh! <laughs> Oh, and that's Lace just you peels the right corner for right Lace off. Because he cannot see through the, he has no idea there's a car there when you're coming through that turn. It's completely blind until it's too late. So the last caution, the first caution of the day, Marty, was because of the expired engine of Ryan hunter Ray. Let's hear from Captain America. Yeah, one of the favorites today, no doubt, Lee. And uh, what did you and I talk about Friday? We cannot have the DNFs. It happens here early in race number one. Had there been any engine issues in preseason testing or anything? No, Honda's done a great job for us. I'm not sure what happened. It just gradually lost power. We'll go back and look at it, of course. It's almost comical at this point at St. Pete. I mean, I, I started from the pit lane here three times with electrical issues, and we just can't, can't really get it uh, sorted at St. Pete. But, you know, 
it's going to put us behind the eight ball in points when it goes for, uh, you know, uh, especially the, 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 the space picking at, at Indy and all that stuff. But, you know, we had some problems this weekend. Um, the, the race car was a bit tough to handle, just a little bit too much push, understeering it. But we'll, we'll figure it out. It's a great team behind me. And um, I'm absolutely loving it. So we'll we'll just we'll just keep soldiering on. That's all we can do. I just I don't know. I don't I don't know what I need to do different. You know, um, it's uh, it's it's unbelievable. He's had the bad luck here at St. Pete before. He knows how to rally though. He's done it and won a title before too, Kevin. And Ryan Hunter Ray was not the first to have to retire. With Sebastian Bourdais, unfortunately, won't be three wins in a row in your adopted hometown. What caused the mechanical? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, it's something to drive train. So. Uh, just uh, lost drive, so not, not quite sure. The engine was running, but uh, no drive, so not, not sure. We'll have to wait and see. Last weekend, did you learn anything that can help you moving forward in testing for this weekend? No, it's uh, unfortunately, I think, uh, a pretty, uh, pretty mute weekend where uh, we didn't learn anything. We, well, I guess we did a little bit in the fact that we tried something on Friday, which really didn't work, went back to the uh, Last year's baseline street course setup, and uh, we, we seem competitive on Saturday morning, and then uh, no run in qualifying, and what 11 laps or something in the race, not even. So, yeah, just uh, a bit of a frustrating weekend for the Steel Master uh, Honda number 18, but uh, you know, a long season ahead. The only positive, at least it's a short trip home, about 10 miles from here, back home for Sebastian Bourdais. Felix Rosenquist leads the opener at St. Pete. Watching NBCSN's coverage of IndyCar brought to you by Firestone. Drive the tire that drives IndyCar legends. By United Rentals, official equipment rental services provider of IndyCar. Join the race to help veterans at turnsfortroops.com. And by Honda, an official vehicle of the NTT IndyCar Series. want to welcome everyone watching via Sky Sports F1 in the UK. Glad you could be with us all season long. It's a great scene here at St. Pete, but not so great for Ed Jones. That was a heavy hit, Kev. It was. He was a big mover in the race early. First, are you okay? Second, what happened? Yeah, I'm fine. Um, you know, I was getting a run on Hinch. I just cut the inside wall at turn nine. We turned the car straight on into the outside wall. Um, you know, it's like for the team after the joke of a qualifying session yesterday we uh we had to make progress early on i was trying to do that and uh, you had to take a bit more risks but it was all my mistake and sorry to the team you know we had a good race car and uh we deserved a good result unfortunately an early in for ed jones with his debut with ed carpenter racing scuderia corsa the driver from dubai he was actually born in dubai to british parents as marco andretti comes in for a stop under this second caution. We'll take a quick break, be back in a moment. It has been Will Power and Felix Rosenquist at the head of this field all day. Still under caution here at St. Petersburg under blue skies, unfortunately for Mateus Lace. Part of the reason we're under caution is because of the crash with your four car. What did you see coming around there to turn nine? Well, to be honest, uh, I, it was hard to see. You know, he was right there. I didn't have anything to do. I went back on the throttle. When I saw I just lost the rear, I clinched him. So, um, fortunately, not the end of the race that we wanted to. But, you know, sometimes it is what it is. You're just at the wrong place at the wrong time. So, um, I'm sorry for the team, sorry for the guys and uh, for the ABC. So, looking forward to the next race now. All right, thank you, Mateus. Ever since moving from Brazil to the United States, Florida has been home for young Mateus Lace. So what a shame. That's back-to-back -back years here at St. Pete. It's ended in the wall. Marty? Hey, Lee, we're coming back to the green. Will Power sitting in second. We saw that issue a moment ago on, lap, on turn 14 where he kind of lost power. That was an overboost issue. The team tells me that is resolved and fine now. But Will did ask a moment ago, what's going to give me the most traction on this restart? They responded in map four. So clearly Will feels like he's had a bit of a deficiency here on these restarts. We also picked up some radio transmission from Alexander Rossi. Take a listen. Remember what Wickens was doing on the starts last year? We talked about on the walk around. Yep, copy. 
So guys, everyone thinking about this restart, Lee. So the restart has been waved off. So despite a lap ago being given the one to go signal, uh, the restart has been waved off. I wonder, Paul, if, if during a track walk with Rosenquist, they were pointing out kind of squaring off dramatically that final corner. If you're the if you're the leader on a restart, you have the prerogative to go way wide in that last corner and square off the last apex. I wonder well, what that is. Maybe we'll see it here on the restart. You do, but like you said when we were at break, look at all the marbles already. Yeah. There's a lot of marbles on the front straightaway already, which is going to cause havoc for the braking zone. Hey, fellas, let's take a look at the Firestone biggest movers of the race. Santino Ferrucci. Uh, is up there with eight positions, too shy of the best in Takuma Sato. The Portland race winner and 2017 Indy 500 winner. He's keen to be more consistent is the theme this year, the former F1 driver. So we'll see what he can do. And rookie Marcus Ericsson from Formula One last year to IndyCar this year. He sits as the third best mover. Kev? Well, the yellow helped a couple of people. Now, it's not good right now because Marco Andretti just outside the top 10 and Graham Rahal was around there, too. They both had punctures right rear for Graham, left front for Marco. So they're way back in the pack right now. Rahal in 20th just came in. Keep an eye on him, though. They're thinking about, can we do this on one more from here? No. <laughs> no way they can do it on one more from here. <laughs> Do you want to think about that? <laughs> no, I don't need to. Hey, Townsend, remember, cautions breed caution. Yeah. So I, I think a lot of teams are thinking that, that the longer this goes with these wide open windows, maybe they could do it on one more. All right, let's see if Will Power can do to Felix Rosenquist what the Swede did to him. Green flag flies here in St. Petersburg, but Felix Rosenquist is far enough ahead of Will Power. No challenge there, but Dixon on the inside of Newgarden. Dixon got a nice draft, but he got the nose chopped off by the Penske car and now he's going to be under attack on the push to pass by How about Rossi? Jack Harvey Jack Harvey holding off his teammate sort of teammate James Hinchcliffe Kimball on Pagano in the background as well the Carlin driver puts his Chevrolet on the inside of the Penske man and gets that position Rossi searching for a way by Dixon tough to really pull up a pass down here into turn 10 you thread the needle through this wide open, flat out kink at about 150 miles an hour. Overtake is active at the time, right? Rob Edwards reminding Rossi that push to pass, the overtake is active at the timeline. It's not available on the first lap of a restart, but it is now, and somebody's coming to pit lane. That's Kimball, I think. Kelly, tell us more about Jack Harvey. Well, you guys pointed him out on that restart. After the previous restart, the team told him that was absolutely perfect. Textbook restart. They wanted him to do it again. He showed it there. He's been battling a little bit of understeer throughout this race, but seems pretty happy with it. They're telling him he's got a lot of push to pass left to use. Guy who's steadily moving forward there in the background is Pagano, but here we see a move by Hinch, but he Still can't there. pull it Still off. There. He gives him enough room. Oh, they made some Still contact there. right there. Still there. That was just good hard driving. Good hard driving from both Jack Harvey and James Hinchcliffe. It's a leaner, meaner Jack Harvey this year. He sheds up 24, 25 pounds. He said, the team, the engineers, the mechanics, they do so much for me. That's the least I could do for them. It's all about performance. And if I can be lighter, that's going to be some free time. And it's Maya Shank Racing. They are supported in a technical alliance with the car that he's being chased by, the Arrow Schmidt Peterson Honda of James Hinchcliffe and Marcus Ericsson. So it's kind of like a three car team, but they are separate entities. And Hinchcliffe Cliff is on push to pass. Harvey has not touched it since the start of the race. They get 150 seconds, and Harvey has every one of those skittles left. Pagano starting to creep up on the back of these guys. They're losing contact to Rossi. A little further back in the pack is Santino Ferrucci. This is this chrome David Yerman Honda, the sole remaining Dale coin entry. And the veteran Tony Kanan, they're scrapping at it. Let's hear some radio. Good job there on the mileage. I'm trying, and Ferrucci is like going bananas in front of me. So I can't really time him pretty well. He's burning a lot of fuel. 
Well, Kanan's been around for 20 plus years, knows how to play the fuel game. Guy in front of him is a rookie. This is his, really his only second or third race now. He raced last year at the end of the season. Still trying to figure that all out as he runs a little bit wide there. Some cars up in front here racing with each other. Pagano now pulling up on the back of these guys. Whoa. Colton Herta on Zach Veach, two young Americans. Colton Herta makes the move. Veach tries to cross him up, but I think Herta will have the advantage going to turn four. That was like the New Garden Mid Ohio move. He went outside, inside on him. That was like for 11th. Nice work from the 18 year old rookie. When we see you in two weeks' time, I think his birthday's fast approaching. He's about to turn 19. Take a look at this. On board with Veach. Woo! That was close. And heads up driving there from Zach Veach, too. He could have fought that harder, but may, maybe one or both would have ended in the concrete wall. Race leader Felix Rosenquist to the tune of one and a half seconds, Kev. I mentioned right when we started the broadcast, right before we started engines, that Felix Rosenquist might do more than just support Scott Dixon. He might be able to win. But when I asked him, can you win on debut, he said, uh, top five would be a really good result for me this weekend. He's humble, but he does have a lot of confidence. He's never won on debut in a series, but did win in Indy Lights here on opening weekend, race two in St. Pete in 2016. Just think about how valuable that is, the driver's say, You know, it's one thing doing the sim, the simulator. There's no replacement for the on-track time. And having on-track time at a tricky 1.8-mile circuit like this in Indy Light several years ago will benefit this 27-year-old Swedish driver immensely. He leads the way. Tonight, the NHL's biggest stars shine bright on an NBCSN Star Sunday doubleheader. First, Brad Marchand and the Bruins take on Yevgeny Malkin and the Penguins. Mike Tirico with the call on that game. Then Drew Doherty and the Kings head down to Anaheim to face off with Ryan Getzlaff and the Ducks. It's NHL Star Sunday presented by AT&T beginning tonight at 7.30 Eastern right here on NBCSN. And of course, speaking of our great pal Mike Tirico, he will be hosting the 103rd running of the Indianapolis 500 this Memorial Day weekend. It's time to say hello to a couple of other mates as well. It is Robin Miller and Jan Bikas on the Peacock Pit Box. Hey, guys. Hey, Lee, and of course, he'll be hosting that from the Pit Box. It's been repositioned now on the inside of turn number one, so Robin and I have a great observation platform to see what's happening today. Very interesting on the strategy, what might happen. We'll get back to that, but Robin, really, some hard fought racing into turn one. It's been a great view. The, the best seat in the world is the outside of turn one, but it's like I told you guys on the NBC Gold Show Friday as we see our first pit stop here. Felix Rosenquist was 50 to one, Lee Diffie, and I told you I was gonna bet all my money on him. How would we be looking right now? Oh, he's looking fantastic, isn't he? As Colton Herter and Takuma Sato are serviced and sent. But Rosenquist is boasting a 1.1 second lead at the moment. That's pretty stable over Will Power. Got a long way to go still. We're nowhere near half distance. This is a long race at 110 laps. We're at 42 laps in now, so coming up on halfway. He's just pacing himself right now, able to maintain the gap on Will Power. 43 laps complete. Doing great. Just keep running your lap. Nice and calm from the pit stand. And for the rest of this IndyCar field, I'll bet they're thinking, man, the last thing this guy needs is experience running up front because oh, yeah. I think they realize that the Swedish rookie is going to spend a lot of time at the sharp end of the grid this season. He's with a great team. He's got arguably the best driver in the history of, history of IndyCar as his teammate. He has all the tools to make a run his rookie year. These guys right here, Hinchcliffe's having a great fight with Jack Harvey. Great to see Michael Shank's team running up front this year. It's their second, second year in the championship. We got some radio with these guys. Let's hear what they got to say. If you're looking for traction, you can soften the rear bar again. You can also open your hands a little bit more coming off of 14. You're a bit tight. Open your hands to the wall. So one driver getting coaching on traction and the other one getting coaching on driving. Harvey was getting some coaching from a driving instructor. Just open your hands up, which means release the car, let it run out to the wall a little bit more. And Hinchcliffe comes to pit lane. 
James Hinchcliffe's first stop was on lap 13. He probably could have gone a few laps early. He's going to come in. He's been complaining of a little bit of understeer in the low speed sections, but Taylor Kyle, his strategist, has said, no changes. Hinch said, whatever you say, let's do it. They're going to primary blacks again. Hinchcliffe, stop number two. Meanwhile, his teammate Marcus Erickson also set to make stop number two, and that yellow saved his race because he was the first to come in on lap six, so he still is right in the window to be able to do it on one more stop. And Erickson really wants to make a positive impression in his maiden NTT IndyCar Series race. So let's see how it wraps up with still 66 laps to go. By the way, after that recent stop, fresh tires, new vision, new view. Colton Herter, the 18-year-old, has just set the fastest lap of the race. Two tenths quicker than the rest of the cars in the field. Third quickest lap of the race is Will Power. And then Rosenquist is fourth quickest lap. Nothing feeds quick laps like youth and impatience. <laughs> and let's take a look at the Speedway race leaders. And that is Rosenquist. Felix Rosenquist has led 25. Will Power, who's doing the chasing now, 17. And during that pit stop cycle, Alexander Rossi led two in his Napa Andretti Autosport Honda. Marty, tell us more. Joseph Newgarden sitting in third a moment ago. Tim Sendrick came on the radio, said it's more important for us to catch the guys in front of us than it is for us to save fuel. So Townsend, I'm wondering as a driver, those gentle reminders once in a while, are you in fuel saving mode? Am I in, am I in all out mode? How important is that from the timing stand to the driver? Uh, it's everything because when you're in the cockpit of these cars, you really lose, you have no visibility into the overarching strategy of the race. So you completely rely on the timing stand like a monkey, just tell me what I need to do. Save fuel, save a lot, save a little, or go fast. Uh, and sometimes both at the same time. Guy who's having a good day, had a terrible qualifying, didn't get a, even a lap in in qualifying, is Simon Pagano. He is looking to rebound this year. He's fr he was frustrated with how last year went, that he could never really get a good balance on the car in a race. And Beach is here in the pits, Kelly. Yeah, and Zach Veach has said that he was losing his front end in the 90-degree corner, so expected him to make a little adjustment there as he gets a fresh set of those primary black firestones. This has been more a, a more composed day for Zach Veach. He was super lucky not to make contact with Ed Jones, who buried it into the wall at turn nine. So a lucky escape, but he's made the most of it. We'll see how Zach Veach's day pans out. Meanwhile, it could not be looking any better for Felix Rosenquist. Well, he's got power closing in on him. It was at a second and a half, almost two seconds, but now he's closed in to about six, seven tenths. We're back here to Pagano. He needs a big year this year. He's a little bit worried about his position uh, for next year. It's a contract year for him, so it's going to be crucial for him to have a good season. Challenge on Jack Harvey here. Uh, a lap or so ago and just overcooked it a little bit into turn one. And now you see Jack Harvey in that peak number 60 machine has come in. He was just lacking some overall grip by the end of that stint, so he'll get some fresh sticker Firestone tires. Listen, I think I think he would argue more that there, there were other better drives, but the most memorable drive for me for Jack Harvey, the 24-year-old Brit last year, was at Portland International Raceway when the series returned there for the first time in many years and just the way the yellows came out he got disadvantaged but it really started to shine there in that um, Auto Nation Sirius XM Honda for Maya Shank Racing so this has been a great run and now Pagano has clear track the Frenchman can do what he likes yeah, he's been very happy with the balance of that 22 car so let's see what he can lay down for lap times here nobody close up front that's what it takes to get clean air across the wings of these cars and see what kind of pace you can put. He's He's got 10 seconds of clean air in front. Dixon and Rossi just down the road, so he's in comfortable territory now with the top drivers in the series, is, which is where he likes to be. So he's got to chase these guys down as we look at the leader. Now Rosenquist, power, right on his tail. Joseph Newgarden maintains third. He continues to have rearview mirrors full of Scott Dixon, the five-time and reigning champion. There he is in the PNC Bank Honda for Chip Ganassi Racing. And then Alex 
Alexander Rossi is in pursuit of him. Behind Rossi is Pagano. We've spoken a lot about him. Great job from the veteran Tony Kennar for AJ Foyt Racing in the ABC Supply Machine. He sits in seventh. And then Marco Andretti, Spencer Pickett, and Max Chilton in the Carlin Chevrolet is in the top ten with 61 to go. So of these cars in the top five, right now Alexander Rossi theoretically should have the most gas in the tank, meaning he can probably go the farthest before making his stop. So that'll come into play as we get close to pit stops. Fastest lap of the race last time for Pagano at a 102.0 as we see Kanan. So Tony Kanan pits from the seventh position as these teams cycle through their pit stops. He's had a very frustrating weekend if they've been trying to get the right setup for the veteran of 301 starts. Now there are scuff blacks going on the 14 car. And the theme for Tony Kanan and AJ Foyt racing this year is let's do the best with what we have got probably are bold enough to acknowledge we can't fight for a championship just yet but let's do the best we can last year was a kind of a frustrating year for himself and his rookie teammate Matthias Leist in fact it was Tony's worst championship position finished since 2000 so he wants to rectify that as Will Power hits pit road Marty yeah pit road getting busy here Will Power coming down pit road Roger Pinsky told him when he went by last time we're coming next time so all of these leaders have pitted around lap 13 are coming down here power no complaints with the car just that one over boost issue before also Alexander Rossi you saw him fly by Will Power he's here on pit road as well he's going with sticker primary tires you see further back Simon Pagano on pit road as well. We talked about how quick they were. They were going to come down pit road earlier, but then they saw Jack Harvey coming down pit road, so they stayed out a couple laps, hoping they could jump him a little bit. We'll see if this early pitting helps these guys in this sequence. Rosenquist last pitted on lap 16. There are 50 laps in the books already, and here he comes. Newgarden closed in on him as he seemed to be struggling with the tires at the end of the stint, Kevin. And before he got the call to pit, they said, turn it up to mixture one, make up some time. So those in laps and then the outlap coming up, always critical. Stop number two from Felix Rosenquist through the lead, legitimately here in his IndyCar Clear. debut. Another set of Firestone Blacks and Rosenquist back at it. Powers coming down the front straight. Here is Power. Look to the right. There is the silver Chevrolet for Team Penske. He's so got he's got him no problem. Got him easy. He was a bit long. Only problem, though, oh, is Power. He might not have him. Oh! oh! He might lose it on the, on the coming on. It's real slick on sticker tires, but Power, Power has traffic. And Spencer, that was close. Spencer Piggott, Rosenquist, figuring out what cold tires and full fuel feels like in the heat of the battle. That was a welcome to IndyCar from Will Power, the reigning Indy 500 champion. Rosenquist stop. He was about a foot long on the marks, and that could have cost him just a little bit of time. We're going to see what happens next when Newgarden pits. Newgarden stayed out, and he was right on the back of Rosenquist when he pitted, so he might have an opportunity to jump him in the pits. We're going to see when they come around this time. Let's have a look at this one more time. That was spectacular. It was close. Rosenquist on the right in the blue machine. Here comes Will Power. Oh, he had to get on the brakes. He had to lock the brakes up to avoid hitting him. Look. And Rosenquist surely had a spotter in his ear saying, inside, inside, watch out. Now Spencer Piggott runs in fourth with Power just behind. Piggott last pitted on lap 21. He still probably has three or four more laps. He's going to hold up. Will Power, Rosenquist is going to have a chance to catch Power well, and potentially make a move. Newgarden and Dixon are still on track. They're going to try to jump these guys in the pits. If they've got the pace, I don't think that Rosenquist had the pace. I think these guys are lighting it up on lap time as Newgarden, I think, is on the push to pass. Newgarden's the fastest car on the racetrack right now. Joseph Newgarden just did a 101.7, and Spencer Piggott's doing 103s.2. Point, point second and a half faster is Newgarden than Piggott, who holds up Will Power. That's why that's important. 
You know what was nice, guys, when we were doing the pre-race show, sitting right on the edge of the grandstand there in the Peacock pit box, was seeing multiple Swedish race fans in the crowd with their shirts, with the Swedish flags, here for Felix Rosenquist and Marcus Eriksson. How it gets Piggott now. Newgarden and Dixon still on track. If it goes yellow, they're really putting themselves in the danger zone that they get caught out by a yellow with these guys racing in and out of the pits. We've seen these guys get hurt by that before, but let's watch Newgarden and see if he comes in this time. Hey guys, Tim Sendrick and Mike Hull, both very aggressive on the radio, telling both of their drivers, Joseph Newgarden and Scott Dixon, be liberal with the push to pass. They're both down to 82 for Newgarden, 80 for Dixon. They're trying to build that gap. We've talked about the Delta on pit road right around 23 seconds. Right now, they're 24 seconds above everybody else. Scott Dixon coming down pit road. Again, he used a ton of push to pass there. Dixon hits pit road here with 56 to go with only 80 seconds left compared to some other guys like Felix Rosenquist. He has 101 seconds left of push to pass. Dixon said a little bit of understeer in that car. It's going to be primary tires for Scott Dixon going on, pitting here with 56 to go, and Joseph Newgarden still on the racetrack using some push to pass. There goes Will Power by Scott Dixon. Dixon's going to come out right with his teammate here, right with Power. He's on cold tires, and so he's beat his teammate out by staying out and running hot laps. Newgarden is going to come out in the lead. He's been laying down fast laps and using the push to pass. He needs a clean, slick stop, and he might come out in the lead. Clever work from Chris Simmons, Mike Hull, and the team of the nine for Scott Dixon. Here is Joseph Newgarden. Does he have the advantage? Where is he going to cycle out? This is going to be close. And here comes Joseph Newgarden, a move by Tim Sendrick that could flip the track position in this race and give Joseph Newgarden the lead, telling him to stay out, working that push to pass. He hits pit road, only 78 seconds left of that. And another move, they're going with the softer red tires, not the primary tires everybody else has on, hoping they can again lay down some lap times, Kevin. It's a fast stop. Marty, you saw Joseph Newgarden going right around Marcus Erickson, who just pitted 10 laps ago, and they just radioed in, shut it off. We've got an engine issue, so they're trying to diagnose that. So the rookie from five years in Formula One is not having the debut in IndyCar that he won. That's, the, that's the leader right now, or sorry, in second, Marco Andretti. Remember, he pitted off sequence, but he's trying to hang on here and stretch this stint as far as he can. But those rear tires have to be fried. He's not the leader. Newgarden's three seconds down the road. He came out and he's long gone. He's way down the, way yes. down the straightaway there. Marco in second. So it's Penske, Penske, Ganassi, Ganassi, Newgarden, Power, Dixon, and Rosenquist. So that traffic for Power being stuck behind Andretti kind of held him up. And it was earlier than that, too, the challenge of trying to get past Spencer Piggott. It has cost Will Power 55 laps to go here in Florida. What a finish this is building towards. The Players' Championship is almost here. Tiger Woods hopes to join a stack field as the best golfers in the world take on the famous Island Green. Don't miss the Players live from TPC Sawgrass, Thursday, 1 o'clock Eastern on Golf Channel, and Saturday at 2 on NBC as we welcome you back to the streets of St. Petersburg for the Firestone Grand Prix of St. Pete with 47 laps to go. Check in with Kevin Lee. Kev? Unfortunately, Marcus Erickson's debut at IndyCar ends early, but... And he's out because of a mechanical that they're still investigating. Water temperature's a little bit too high. I want to talk to you, though, about the racing. You are moving up pretty well. How was it going? It was a great race up until then. You know, we, we started quite far back, but back to me, we think we should have started. So, you know, it was going well. We, we were well inside the top 10 when we had the problem. So, you know, looking at what's happening now, we were definitely going for a top eight. So, yeah, it was, was a shame because uh, it was a really, really great race up until then. Fun to compete again for the first time in six years, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was great. A lot of overtakes and, you know, restarts and stuff like that. And I felt like I really made the most of it. And yeah, it was fun to make some really proper overtakes and wheel-to-wheel -wheel action. So I was having a lot of fun. It was just a shame that it uh, ended early. And the next track he knows, Circuit of the Americas, from his time in Formula One. Fully committed to the IndyCar program and is living in Indianapolis, brought his trainer over from Europe as well and is excited about this season ahead. Meanwhile, race leader Joseph Newgarden Paul has a six and a half second lead. Yeah, another note to be taken there with Erickson falling out, another Honda issue, water temperature problems. And as we look at Newgarden, 
This now is just be a pacing problem. himself. For uh, Newgarden is, is Charlie Kimball there. Now Kimball's a lap down. That should help Newgarden in that the blue flag should start to come out with a lap down car in front, but that's gonna help Scott Dixon close the gap. And I think with Newgarden going to Reds, the only car to do it late in the race like this up front with Newgarden doing that, I think they plan Marty on a short stint here and go long on blacks for the final stint of the race. That would be the theory for Joseph Newgarden. Yes, going a short stint here for everybody. And when Tim Sendrick and Mike Hole really flip the pit strategy here, put themselves in first and second, Tim just radioed to Joseph, uh, Joseph Newgarden a moment ago to update him on the situation. Here's what they had to say. This is going to be the guy we're going to have to race. He's got 65 left on his overtake. He has 65. Where's he at? Six seconds back. Marco just let him by, so he's clear between you and him. So there you go. The two camp thinks it's a race between them and Scott Dixon for the win here at St. Pete. But kudos to both of those strategists for kind of flipping the script a little bit. They were sitting in third and fourth when that happened. Now the first and second. Kimball's no notoriously tough to pass, but right now Townsend, his pace is pretty good. He's a 102.6. Newgarden's last lap was a 2-3, and Dixon was a 2-3. So not really holding him up bad, but there's a bit of a, uh, you know, a situation where you give a guy a break when you're a lap down and we'll see if he lets him go by here as he does like he did. that's very cool from charlie kimball you know what else is cool in the off season charlie and wife kathleen became parents kathleen gave birth to their first daughter their first child uh baby hannah and she's doing well and charlie was excited about this weekend saying i'm going to get to introduce my daughter to the world of motor racing find this kind of interesting we're 11 laps into this stint for newgarden he's on the softer red tire but i've been watching the lap times and scott dixon has been faster the last couple of laps on the black tires he's eating into it isn't it, it was 6.7 seconds the lead now it's 5.9 seconds so he's almost taken a one full second chunk out um so we'll see if that trend continues. It could have been for the time, though, that he was behind Charlie Kimball. There have been some transmission and technical issues, and we uh, apologize for that. The Firestone Grand Prix of St. Peterbur St. Petersburg continues. Team Penske's Joseph Newgarden leads the way and leads handily to the tune of six seconds. However, the second place Scott Dixon has been eating into that steadily uh, over the past few laps. Will Power is third. Felix Rosenquist, the rookie, is fourth. Alexander Rossi is fifth. James Hinchcliffe, sixth. Simon Pagano, seventh. Graham Rahal, eighth. His teammate, and Ray Hall, Letterman, Lanigan, Takuma Sato is ninth. And Colton Herter, the 18-year-old rookie who's done a terrific job this weekend, he is in the top 10. But at the moment, the teams at both Penske and Ganassi really feel the race over these last 43 laps, Townsend, is between Joseph Newgarden and Scott Dixon. Well, and for Joseph Newgarden, right now, untouchable on fastest lap. He's done a 101.7, the only driver in the one minute, one second bracket. Second fastest, Pagano, and then Dixon in third with a 102.0. But long way to go here, and any sort of yellow is going to completely change the scope of this race. And for Newgarden, for Dixon, for Power, those timing stands, you have to start thinking about, do I take the risk to be the first one to make the last stop and potentially have to stretch it on fuel, but at the same time, ensure myself against a yellow coming out in that danger zone window, or do I stay out on this stint as long as possible and try to leapfrog somebody on the sequence? That'll be interesting with about 35 laps to go, seven laps from now. For those of you yeah. just joining us out of the race, two-time winner, Sebastian Bourdais, Ryan hunter -Ray, who won the season finale last year, Ed Jones smashed into the wall very heavily, and Matthias Leist hit him, and then most recently, Marcus Ericsson from Formula One to IndyCar. He had some kind of a mechanical issue, and he is out. So the attrition rate is starting to grow, and so too, by the way, Paul is Joseph Newgarden's lead. He's put almost half a second on Scott Dixon over that last lap. Yeah, he's definitely got the pace, and there's no advantage to him trying to stretch this set of tires, stretch the fuel. He needs to get inside the window and take the first opportunity because if it goes yellow, 
that is going to basically end it for him if other guys pit. He's got a big advantage, and as soon as the window opens, he needs to take advantage of that and get that last stop done. Just having a look at potential lap traffic for Joseph Newgarden up front. And it looks like, there it is, Newgarden has caught the tail end of the lead lap. That's Max Chilton. And Chilton behind us. Keep pushing. P -P has every it. right to try to hang on here, but that number two team is going to start to get more and more animated with race control because that gap that they've worked so hard to earn, 6.3 seconds over Scott Dixon, Joseph Newgarden does not want to see that disappear. Chilton gets an exit off the corner. We'll see if he lets him by down this long straightaway right here. Because if Chilton he'll, gets a yellow, he'll fight to stay on the lead lap. It's Like I said earlier, it's a bit of a courtesy. Do you be fair with guys or do you fight for that lead? He might be inclined to fight a little bit because he knows and has been told Dixon has a big lead. Now he's getting the blue for flag. A yellow, but that blue flag is out. But he doesn't have to move over and let him go by. It's it's a courtesy if he feels like it. Good job. Keep getting your exit shot. Keep getting your exit. Nose cam with Graham Rahal, who comes to pit lane. Now, Graham pitted pit early off sequence. We ride back on board with Chilton. We heard the radio. He said, keep getting your exit shots. So they are not going to let Newgarden go by. They're fighting to stay on the lead lap. Uh, here's, the other, motion happens, right? here, here's the other problem for Newgarden. He's having to burn push to pass to get by. And he needs that push to pass if he's going to battle Dixon at the end. And there goes Newgarden. And Newgarden is down to 69 seconds of the allocated 150 seconds of push to pass. We'll take a quick break from some feedback in just a moment. Thanks for hanging in there with us and apologies for the technical difficulties as we welcome you back to the Firestone Grand Prix of St. Petersburg. Round one of the 2019 NTT IndyCar Series. And what a day this could be for Joseph Newgarden of Team Penske, the 2017 IndyCar Series champion. He's never won here on the streets of St. Pete and would dearly love to do it again to do it for the first time, I should say, today. He boasts a 6.2 second lead over Scott Dixon. Will Power, his Penske teammate, is in third. Felix Rosenquist is fourth. And then Alexander Rossi is in the top five on a beautiful afternoon in Florida. And I've been impressed, Paul, that Joseph Newgarden can keep pace on those Firestone Reds. He has 20 laps on the tires, and he still has the measure lap time-wise. Yeah, the normally talkative Santino Ferrucci, the rookie, has been very quiet on the radio. He came in for Speedway Fuel, fuel and some sticker black Firestone tires. So out goes Ferrucci to rejoin towards the tail end of the pack. And here comes Scott Dixon, and now Scott Dixon is encountering the traffic that Newgarden had to deal with a few laps earlier. That's Max Chilton again, and then Charlie Kimball still one lap down. Chilton's one lap down okay. now, of course. That time that he lost, Newgarden, that one second at times, has now stretched out to seven seconds as Dixon now has to deal with these two lap cars. And we're 35 laps to go, so we're just starting to enter the window, the window for making your final stop. It's going to be fascinating to see who places their bets here between Dixon and Newgard and their timing stands. Who wants to gamble? Who wants to push it? I think the safe play is to pit Newgarden earlier rather than later. So they're 20 laps into this stint. They're going to be giving their feedback to their engineers how the tires feel now, knowing that they've got to do 30 plus laps to the end of this race. But Newgarden and his team have played this perfectly. Scott Dixon's trying to negotiate a couple of old Ganassi teammates first, Charlie Kimball, and then the other Carlin competitor in the Gallagher Chevrolet in Max Chilton is the next one on his list. What you got, Marty? Guys, let's chat with Vito Mabruco from NTT. And not only is this your first race as a series prime race monster, but your driver's doing awfully well. Yeah, he's doing fantastic, isn't he? Uh, yeah, excellent. I mean, we're really happy to be here, and we're thrilled to be the entitled to sponsor for the IndyCar Series. Uh, for us, NTT, we're a Fortune 100 global technology company. 
but not a lot of people are aware of us. And so this was a great opportunity for us to associate with a really great brand with IndyCar. So we're very happy today, and we're looking forward to the season. You mentioned it's such a big company in Japan. How important is it to get that company recognition here in the U.S., Vito? Exactly. It's important for us to get recognition both here in the U.S. and worldwide, but also to partner with someone like IndyCar, who's so focused on technology for performance and also to drive the fan experience. We think that's a key component of this partnership because we really want to drive more fan engagement for IndyCar and the sport overall. So we're really looking forward to working with uh, IndyCar to do that. All right, we're certainly happy to have NTT. And how about their driver, Felix Rosenquist, right now in fourth, Diff? Oh, buddy, it's been a stunning debut for Rosenquist. And in addition to NTT being the entitlement and naming rights sponsor for the series, uh, Firestone has extended their deal through 2025 as the exclusive and sole tyre supplier. And by the way, this is the 20th season that Firestone has been the sole tyre supplier. Acura takes over as naming rights sponsor for the Grand Prix of Long Beach. We're looking forward to that early in the season. There's so much positivity surrounding the NTT IndyCar Series right now. Tremendous momentum, and I'm watching Joseph Newgarden, and his momentum continues. Now nine-second lead over Scott Dixon. He pitted earlier with the Reds, but he's managed his tire wear exceptionally well. And his pace right now is kind of next level, Paul. Really, nobody's in his category. No, not at all. But Dixon makes a move on his teammate, ex-teammate, Chilton, who has held him up for another lap and a half. So that has really cost him in terms of the gap. It was at six seconds, and now it's stretched out to nine and a half. These guys are going to be pitting here. Pinch, we hear, is hitting the pit lane. Now we're in the window, so these guys are going to hit it in the next lap or two. And this should be the final stop for James Hinchcliffe. As you mentioned, the window is just opening up, so I'm sure some fuel save, but it's not massive at this point. A turn of front wing, Hinchcliffe back out. Behind him, you saw Takuma Sato stopped in his pit. He's been here for a couple of minutes. The car wouldn't shift, so they've been looking at the electronics. Sato was running in the top 10, had a good chance for a result, but it's not going to happen. Marco Andretti also coming in. Now, this is a short stint for Marco. He's one of the few to use a second set of red alternate Firestones. This was a short stint, 15. He had to come in and get off strategy because of a puncture back out to do the last stint on primaries, but it hasn't been that good for Marco. Car has not been handling well. And Joseph Newgarden is coming to you, Marty. Indeed, Tim Sindrick gave him the track position, and Joseph Newgarden delivered on the racetrack. What a fantastic stint on those red tires. Everybody in the paddock was a little concerned about the wear on those red tires. He did a masterful job, actually gapped Scott Dixon a little bit more, as you guys mentioned. The primary sticker tires going on, and the half-turner front wing to compensate for those primary tires. We'll see what the lead is once this all cycles out. If you go, when you get a chance, wheel one, Simon's going to pit this lap. So Simon Pagano, his teammate, coming in this time by. It was a really weird season last year for Joseph Newgarden. The high points were three wins at Phoenix, at Barber, and at Road America. But then he didn't stand on the podium other than that, so it was quite bizarre. Kelly? That's the Englishman, Jack Harvey, making what should be his last pit stop. The team really happy with the lap times he was putting down on that last stint. They went to sticker black tires. This is really rewarding for Mike Shank and Jim Meyer and everybody associated with the MSR team. Oh, an awkward moment here for AJ Foyt Racing and Tony Kanaan. Bit of a disaster. The guy went to throw the gun and got wrapped around the front wing as we see Dixon coming in. Yeah, the guy sitting in second place. The gap was nine seconds with Joseph Newgarden hit pit road. Scott Dixon coming down pit road. We'll see if the nine team can gain any time here for Dixon, who's had a little bit of an understeer, but not very unhappy with the car. Pretty happy with it on that stint. You see those primary tires going on for Dixon. A little further down pit road, Will Power on pit road. The pole sitter today, who's led so much of the race today. And also Simon Pagino on pit road. Newgarden, long gone, Diff. He's going to hold on to lead. He's Yes, there was no pressure there whatsoever, not like we saw on the previous stop and scramble back out as Pagano comes out in front of traffic. Here's Felix Rosenquist. He inherits the lead, but is due to stop anytime soon. Sensational debut performance for the 27-year-old Swede. Runs a little bit wide, coming off the last corner. Dives for the pit lane. All right, same as before, except we got Pinkett's guys set up. We got to come around this group here. 
That's Barry Wanzer talking him in. He calls strategy for the number 10 car for NTT Data. Remember, he lost the lead in the last pit sequence. One of the last among the leaders to pit this time. What can they do? Final stop in an impressive debut race in IndyCar for Felix Rosenquist. Remember what happened to Rosenquist with Will Power last time. I'm looking, where is Will Power? Just coming through turn one now. There he is. Let's see if they meet again going down to turn four. Draw clear, clear. So this is a lot more orderly. <laughs> Race leader Joseph Newgarden has that five and a half second lead. Now out to 5.8. So it is very comfortable for the driver from Hendersonville, Tennessee. Uh oh, this could be a yellow. That is a banner, a tarp, or a blanket. Somebody must have hit the wall at the turn one and dragged the Chevy banner off of the wall. It's kind of offline, so I don't know if they'll they really need to go yellow for that. Well, to certainly shake things up. They went too wide through there. I don't think that would be particularly safe. Not that I'm rooting for a yellow or anything, but. Yeah. Apparently race control saying it's out of the line, but with a stiff wind that could be online. There's Rosenquist and he just got beat by power again coming out of the pits. And there's Colton Herta. Now, I was wondering who's going to be the first to make the last stop. I'm pretty sure it's this guy, Colton Herta, having a strong run good in the job, top good ten. Job. You can reel him in. Keep digging, buddy. Now, he's got Graham Rahal in front of him, but Graham pitted on lap 70. I don't think Graham could make it to the end with the fuel on board unless he's in super, super save mode and gets a big yellow. So then Colton Herta was six laps after Graham Rahal on lap 76. So. You know, the race at Sonoma last year, which was Colton Herter's very first IndyCar race, that was not quite memorable. He DNF'd and finished 20th. This has been a lot more memorable. Now, this was the moment we had just missed. Rosenquist leaving pit lane on cold tires. Oh, Power just got him again. I'm sure Felix is thinking. So was it Will Power who peeled that banner off? It looks like it was already down. Sorry, it was too, yeah. The banner was down and it got ran over probably by a couple of cars and then dragged to the other side of the track. But right now we see Rosenquist come through one, two, three, down the back straightaway. He's lost a bit of gap to power now. Let's walk our way through the rest of the top 10. Alexander Rossi has had a quiet day, but still a strong day in fifth. James Hinchcliffe in sixth, good championship points there. Remember, Hinch missed the Indy 500 last year, the double point scoring Indy 500, and still finished in the top 10 in the championship. Pagano's in seventh, Ray Hall, Herder, and Santino Ferrucci. You've been watching NBCSN's coverage of IndyCar, brought to you by Chevrolet, the most awarded car company four years in a row by NTT, official sponsor and technology partner of the NTT IndyCar Series. And by Firestone, drive the tire that drives IndyCar legends. It's been a gorgeous weekend here in St. Pete for the season opener of the NTT IndyCar Series. Lee Diffie, Townsend Bell, Paul Tracy, the very first winner of an IndyCar race here at St. Pete, by the way, was our PT. And Marty Snyder on pit road, Marty. Indeed, uh, Lee, and 23 laps stand between Joseph Newgarden and the win here in race number one of 2019. It was a busy offseason for Joseph. He went on a trip to Japan and then proposed to his longtime girlfriend, Ashley Welch. So congratulations to the happy couple. There you see the tweet on their trip to Japan. Got down on one knee like a good young man should. And then a couple weeks ago, actually last week, he was in Nashville, his hometown. He's a Nashville, Tennessee native, loves his Preds, got to hang out with our Pierre Maguire there inside the glass. And of course, Pierre reminded him of that puck that almost hit Pierre a couple weeks ago. That did not happen when Joseph was there. But Joseph did offer Pierre a ride, two-seater, at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Townsend, I'm thinking if I'm Pierre, I'm going to say no thank you to maybe the two-seater ride at the Brickyard. What do you think? I, I know it'd be a fun ride, but I don't know if Pierre wants to tackle that one. Well, if he talks to Tony Junji, he might get a mixed mixed result. Tony looked a little, little surprised at the experience at the speed, but Mario took good care of him. So 
If it was me, I'd jump at it. Well, I can tell you, Marty, that Pierre is going to jump at it. He sent me a text yesterday during our qualifying show. He said, I'm watching the broadcast. I am a new fan of IndyCar and Joseph Newgard, and I loved hanging out with Joseph. I, I was buzzed by his enthusiasm for the Preds and NHL. And I said, by the way, Pierre, uh, Joseph just told Marty Snyder on air, he's offering you a two-seater ride. He said, count me in. I'm all over that. And he said it's not just for the Indy 500 or the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. It's an open invitation, Pierre. So wherever you want to ride, Joseph's got a two-seater ready. Five seconds is the difference between Newgarden and Dixon. Can Scott Dixon start his title defense with a victory? Can he get by this man with just 22 laps remaining? Top three guys, all series champions. Dixon, last year's champion, followed by the rookie in fourth, Rosenquist. Rossi fighting for a championship, his first. We know that's going to come in the future. Hinchcliffe running in sixth. And there's Ben Hanley, who has quietly ticked off all the boxes this weekend as Newgarden comes up to lap him. Hanley with the Dragon Speed team doing the right thing. Dern all the laps, get the experience as Scott Dixon continues to try to find a way to close the gap. But the problem for Dixon, he's burned up a lot of the push to pass trying to get around that lap traffic. Right now, Newgarden has 36 more seconds left in the bag, and that's just an insurance policy should they get nose to tail towards the finish. He has twice, more than twice as much push to pass seconds left than what Scott Dixon does. So you would say power and strength to Joseph Newgarden. Will power as a further Four and a half seconds behind this man here, the orange, white, and blue PNC Bank Honda in third place. So it's kind of fairly evenly spread out on the provisional podium sitters. You got it to Dixon to power. Rosenquist may be denied a podium on debut, but it's been a very solid start. Kanan pulls over for Dixon, lets him go by to continue the chase just down the road. Newgarden right now at 5.4 seconds. It was as high as nine and a half. So Dixon is clawing it back, but running out of time. Still 20 laps to go. So we've got a lot of laps, but we go by quick here, Townsend. Yeah, 20 laps, still plenty of opportunity for a caution that could come out. You know, deep in the field, this is when you start to see some wheel-to-wheel -wheel battles and guys trying to make something happen that don't necessarily have such a great result in front of them. Here is the number 20 Auto Geek Chevrolet for Spencer Pickett. It's a Chevrolet driver profile, and he's the first non-Penske Chevy in this field. And Spencer, who grew up uh, and was raised in Orlando, not too far away here in Florida, runs 13th at the moment. Pardon me, I said number 20, but number 20. Spencer Pickett. My apologies there. So he runs one position behind Marco Andretti. Jack Harvey one position ahead of him. There is Marco. Jack Harvey's in uh, 11th and Santino Ferrucci runs in the top 10, which is an impressive run in the sole remaining Dale Coin entry. Herta has found his way by Ray Hall. We know Ray Hall's light on fuel, probably in save mode, might have to do a splash. So we look at Hitchcliffe now coming up. And there's Rossi. I haven't talked a lot banner. about Alexander Rossi today outside of the start. I'm a little surprised he finds himself 17 seconds back right now as they run from the leader, Newgard. And Marty, he had great pace last year here in the closing laps. And it's a top five run so far, but not challenging like we might have expected. Yeah, sitting in fifth, and they were catching Felix Rosenquist and closing that gap a little bit. But then Max Chilton got in their way, and Jeremy Millis is the engineer for Alexander Rossi. He's a big boy. He was not very happy. He stomped all the way down to Max Chilton's pit, about 18 pits away, and told them to their face how unhappy he was with that move. Chilton a lap down. Rossi trying to catch fourth place, and they feel like it cost him a lot of track position. 18 to go. Joseph Newgarden in the lead here at St. Pete, trying to win the first race of 2019.
a beautiful day here in St. Petersburg, but so many people up and down pit line are looking forward to Austin, Dakota. Circuit of the Americas is coming up this year as a new stop on the calendar, and that is something that I know after a recent test with the high-speed corners and so much different than what we see here on the street circuit that that'll be a great addition, Robin, to what we have because there's so many different disciplines, and Coda is about as far away as you can get from the street circuit at St. Petersburg. And if we can put on a good race at Barber, a track built for motorcycles, you know Coda's a good race. But I want to tell the booth one thing, Lee. Felix Rosenquist didn't lose this race on the racetrack. He got beat in the pits. They had decent pit stops, but he made the best pass of the race on willpower for the lead. He's going to finish fourth because he got beat in the pits, not on the racetrack. Well, Robin, hang on. We don't know how they're going to finish at this point because well, we could have a caution, and that's the point. I think that last stop, the third stop that everyone made, there was a lot of gamesmanship going on. Just like Townsend said, you want to be the first one to make the last stop. Now they're positioned, but if we get a midfield caution, if someone brushes the wall now, it is game on. Well, I hope, I almost hope, hope that it. happens because this kid, like the pass he made on Will, locking up the front and keeping it going, but the thing of it is, his team's got a good team, and they had good pit stops. They just weren't as good as Penske's or Scott Dixon's. Yes, and I think today there was a lot of strategy being played, and there was a lot of risk versus reward. And I think we saw a lot of early pit stops, and that's now spread these cars out a little bit. You know, I don't want to be one saying, I hope we have a yellow, but I think if we do, again, that would open the whole game up again. We just want a small yellow. <laughs> well, Robin, I've heard you used to be my manager and cheerleader for about 25 years. It sounds like you got a new guy over there. <laughs> you've, been, you've been kicked to the curb, son, uh, Felix Rosenquist. But I've been touting him since Stefan Johansson turned me on to him like five years ago, and then he won the Indy Lights race here. And I kept, when I wrote the story last year at Pocono that he was going to be on Ganassi's team, you know, Chip got mad at me, and he goes, that's just a rumor. Thankfully, it became a fact. Speaking of Chip Ganassi racing drivers, I want to congratulate Dario Franchitti, a four-time champion in the NTT IndyCar Series. He's going to be inducted into the Motorsports Hall of Fame of America this coming week, and Scott Dixon will be there to present that. Alexander Ross is going to be in attendance as well. So well done, Dario, from all of your friends here in the IndyCar paddock. Kelly? There you see the 14 of Tony Kanan and a great sight here this weekend is his team owner there, AJ Foyt. Foyt, Super Tex is back. This is the first time he's been back in a race since undergoing back surgery last July. Tony told me he absolutely loves having AJ here at the track. He says he walks around and sees things that other teams are doing. And he said, I don't think anybody else notices. He said he's always lifting us up. He also motivates the entire team. And he also said, hey, it's nice to have him out here at the track so he can stay out of trouble back on his ranch. St. Petersburg, Florida today is the only place you can see two five-time IndyCar champions. One in Supertex, AJ Foyt, the other is Scott Dixon, who's only 3.2 seconds behind Joseph Newgarden now. That lead has come down substantially. Question is, is Newgarden just sort of managing the gap and the pace, or is he had a little bit of trouble, and Dixon's coming. Well, We're going to find think, out. I think Dixon's coming because it was up to nine and a half seconds, and Dixon has just been putting the laps down and clawing it down. It's now down to 2.9 seconds. So, And that might be the answer right there. Marco Andretti trying to stay on the lead lap. Andretti on the soft compound red tires to finish the race. But there's 20 laps on those reds. And there's Dixon in the, in the distance. Marty? Listening to both radios, Dixon certainly pushing Newgarden, more managing the gap, I would say, right now. But the one thing I'm going to point to, guys, push to pass. Scott Dixon has used a lot of it. He only has 30 seconds left. Joseph Newgarden has 63 seconds left. So a lot more time to push to pass for Joseph Newgarden. And the other factor in all this, a little traffic for them. So that's going to make things interesting here with 11 to go. Well, I'll tell you what will also matter is Newgarden's having to use that push to pass advantage now. And it's not working yet to get by Marco Andretti. So Newgarden burning precious seconds on the button to deal with slower cars. Need to jump away from St. Pete for just for a moment. It's 2.6 seconds the gap. We'll update you on it when we come back. 
with just with just over eight laps remaining here in St. Pete. The gap is down to two seconds. It got down as low as 1.3 between Joseph Newgarden and Scott Dixon. Newgarden was finally able to get by Marco Andretti, and now Dixon has cleared the Andretti Autosport driver as well. And so it's a race over these final eight laps. It's been a gamesmanship. We heard some radio transmission that the Honda guys were holding up the Chevy guys, and the Chevy guys were playing fair. Newgarden was all over the push to pass, just trying to get by. There you see seconds remaining on the left-hand side of the screen. Newgarden used up a bunch. Let's listen to this radio for Joseph Newgarden. Yeah, man, nine to go. All the Chevy guys let all the Honda guys go by, but it doesn't work the other way. Tim Sendrick on the stand, not too thrilled with the reciprocity. Well, Graham Rahal just let Newgarden go by real easy on the straightaway. Now he's got Dixon coming up behind him, but we've got a close race here with eight to go. Now look at this. Newgarden, Newgarden making a move, but it took several laps and it still almost didn't happen down in turn one as Marco Andretti and Joseph Newgarden came very close. He really had to break late and jam it in there and just like almost came wheel to wheel with them. Gap down to 1.7 seconds. Ray Hall is on the list for Dixon to clear. And I would expect Graham to make it pretty easy for Dixon oh, right there. Tried to, cool. make it, tried to make it easy, but kind of held Dixon up quite a bit. Dixon, I don't think, was expecting him to just let him open the door up and op pull over to the side over there. And it looked like it slowed Dixon down a lot. A little dangerous for Graham, too, because there's so many marbles on the track at this stage in the race, especially offline in that section, that single groove. But Dixon back on the pace, 2.1 seconds back now. That last lap, Dixon three tenths quicker than Newgarden. We'll have to see what happens across the line. PT, back in the day, did you relish this opportunity to be like Dixon and be a chaser? No, I'd rather be out. I'd rather be out front, controlling the pace. It's it's tough to pass here. We saw how tough it was for Newgarden just to get by Marco Andretti, but Dixon, he's a smart guy. He knows that if he's got the car, he's going to get the points. He's not going to stick his neck out and take a huge risk. He knows how to play the game to win championships. Did you guys notice the banner disappeared all of a sudden from the track? It was on the track there. Somebody's retrieved it, or it's been blown back in towards the fence. It was off the racing surface. Meanwhile, the gap first to second from Newgarden to Dixon has stabilized at 2.2 seconds, 2.3 now. So the Penske Chevrolet driver up front, Joseph Newgarden, who's had this steely determination throughout the off season. He has trained like crazy and he was frustrated. He, he had this mantra of defend the one last year. He wanted to defend his 2017 title. He couldn't do it. He has not been driving anything else in the off season. Hasn't been doing any of the sports car races or off-road races. He's been waiting for this moment. And with six to go, Six laps of the 1.8 mile circuit, he will get that victory. And he won was three times last year, but has been just so eager to get back behind the wheel of his Penske Chevrolet. And he was a little frustrated after qualifying that he was beaten to the pole by Will Power, his teammate, because he said, I just I had a sloppy lap, I made some mistakes, but there's no better way to redeem yourself than to go out and drive like he has today. And you talk about last year, Lee, no DNFs for Joseph Newgarden all season. And that's the kind of streak coupled with wins and podiums that Joseph Newgarden will need to reclaim the championship this year. But Scott Dixon's going to run them all the way to the end, I'm sure. And there'll be other drivers that have something to say about it. Dixon's still hanging right there at about 2.2 seconds back, though. So lots of talk, and it's easy to talk about the superstars. How about the rookies a little further back? Colton Herder, here he is, the 18-year-old second-generation racer, son of Brian Herder, who's on the box up at... Uh, Herder Andretti Autosport. He's controlling Marco Andretti's race. Here's his teenage son, who is the lead rookie at the moment in eighth. And Santino Ferrucci in that very recognizable chrome David Yerman entry for Dale Coyne Racing. The driver from Connecticut is in ninth at the moment. So for three rookies, Rosenquist fourth, Herder in eighth, and Ferrucci in ninth. Three rookies to be in the top ten. Great day. Great day for Ferrucci. He started way in the back. You can see he's resting his hand up there. He's probably getting a little bit tired now. He's a little tiny guy. So getting down towards the end of the race, he's building up his race fitness towns. And this, like I said, he's a very small guy. Who are you calling tiny? 
It's all relative. <laughs> so coming up to three laps to go for Joseph Newgarden, who has not only maintained and composed and kind of hit the reset button, he's now grown his lead by almost half a second over Scott Dixon. It's Penske in two places on the podium at the moment, with Newgarden in first, Power in third. Power's got multiple seconds, three in fact, over Felix Rosenquist, so no immediate threat on Will Power's third place at the moment. Hey Lee, you mentioned it a moment ago, last year for Joseph Newgarden, three wins, and those were his only podium. So Friday when he and I sat down and chatted, he said, that is the number one thing for us. We have to get the wins, yes, but we have to turn those other days into podium finishes, and that's where we missed it in trying to win the championship in 2018. So Joseph Newgarden, fantastic start if he can hold on for three more laps, but at these races where it isn't going well, that's the focus this year to get those podiums. And just think about the strength from the captains, teams, teams, and I say plural, in the Monster Energy NASCAR Cup Series, what the teams have been doing there, what they've been doing in Australia with Scott McLaughlin in the Supercar Series, and now these guys felt the pressure. Roger Penske told us the other day that these guys, these three, Pagano, Power, and Newgarden, came to him and Tim Sindrick and said, oh, look, I guess it's up to us now. We've got to, we've got to carry our end of the deal. Well, they most certainly have here today. I saw Roger last night in the lobby of the hotel. I said, man, you're firing on all cylinders. They've won the first two races in Australia. They got both of their drivers in the chase. A car on pole Playoffs. today for Playoffs. the cup race. And looks like they're heading oh! for another win today. Big sideways for Hinch coming off the last corner. And we haven't talked about Hinchcliffe much today, but former winner here needed a strong start to the season like those Penske drivers and I know it's sixth place but it's a it's a really strong solid run for for Hinch in this team and they really struggled at points during the weekend not a great qualifying result but they're fighting through it and they're fighting through that lap traffic Ben Hanley just getting out of the way as Hinch had big oversteer coming onto the front straight and it's a shame that his Arrow Schmidt Peterson teammate Marcus Erickson couldn't finish on debut. But it'll be a strong points finish for James. 1.8 miles to go for Joseph Newgarden. So proud of his roots in Tennessee, but has lived now since joining the Penske organization, has lived in North Carolina. He lives in a beautiful little college town called Davidson. And he's getting engaged, he's get, sorry, he's getting married this year, got engaged in the offseason. This is a huge year for him in 2019, and he's starting it off the best possible way. And this was a forceful demonstration too. Good driving, good strategy. It was the pieces of the puzzle put together just nice. And I really think the difference was that decision by Tim Sindrick to go with the Reds there yeah. on the shorter stint and give Newgarden a chance to open up some pace dominate a little bit there. I thought it was a bit risky, but clearly Cindric and Team Penske had the information. They knew what they were dealing with. This was one circuit that the 2017 champion has not been victorious on. Up until now, Joseph Newgarden. He wins in St. Petersburg to get the 2019 season off to the best possible start. I thought that we get a win for the year. And this Penske juggernaut continues in 2019, no matter what the series, no matter what the country around the world. And Joseph Newgarden picks up career job, win number 11. Thanks, Rick. Well, I was expecting havoc today with these guys, but that was a nice clean race and hard racing up front. We had three of the, three of the top five guys all swapping the lead on pit stops coming in and out of the pits. There could have been disaster when those guys were doing the over-under, nearly colliding with each other, coming out of the pits, but nice clean race today. And that continues the domination of this event by Team Penske as well, whether it be Elio Castro Neves, Ryan Briscoe, Will Power, Juan Pablo Montoya. Now you can put Joseph Newgarden's name on that list as a winner of the Firestone Grand Prix of St. Petersburg. Penske continues to dominate the streets of St. Pete. The start of the weekend, they did not look good. They were in the mid-teens, but really gathered it back up for Saturday qualifying. Teammate Will Power drifts by. He picks up a podium spot behind Scott Dixon, but it is all about the New Garden family celebrating a victory in Florida. 
It's always an enjoyable way to kick off the IndyCar year here in St. Petersburg on the shores of Tampa Bay. And it's even better if your name's Joseph Newgarden. You are victorious for the first time at this famed street circuit. And Team Penske celebrate, rightfully so. That wasn't all his way today. He had to work hard for that. Started on the front row alongside teammate Will Power. And Marty Snyder finds himself, thankfully, victory lane. And what a big win for Joseph Newgarden and Team Penske. They start 2019 the right way here in victory lane at St. Pete. Gonna go give uh, his new fiance Ashley a kiss and the team a little bath. I bet that feels good on an 85 degree day here. Hey Joseph, talk to me about how you and Tim Sindrick flipped the track position number one and then how key was that run on the reds to kind of make a gap on Scott Dixon? Well, we, yeah, we, were, we were literally talking about it right before the race, Tim and me were trying to figure out should we go used or new reds and we made the call at the last minute to stay used. We'll have that advantage uh, if we need it, and we used it. It just worked out perfectly. I mean, I can't thank Chevy enough for all their support and what they put in this weekend. Incredible engine. We had everything we needed, fuel mileage, reliability, and all, all the power. Um, and then the Hitachi car was just, I'm telling you, we really figured things out on Saturday, and, and it was a rocket ship. So, so thankful to our group. We have uh, the best of the best working at Team Penske. Yeah, what did you tell me in the offseason that this was the number one priority, street courses? So did this answer the question that you figured that out? Well, we started on the right foot for sure. I mean, I think we made a big step. We felt positive about the step that we made. So uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the rest of the year. The street courses, I think we feel better on. We got to convert that to road courses now at Coda. And then obviously Indianapolis is still going to be a priority. So let's see where we're at a little later on in the year. How tough was that lap traffic today? Because at times it seemed dicey. You had to use a lot of push to pass to get around them. Killing me. It, you know, I mean, it was definitely manufacturers playing uh, good guys with each other. But it was really tough. I mean, um, I just didn't want to see people in front of me. I wanted to keep running my laps, and I knew I had the pace to, to keep in front of Scott, but I was just worried about something going wrong. And when you have that many cars in front, that's, that's normally what can happen. But everyone was kind enough is what I would say. It's still hard, but they were kind enough. <laughs> so what did you tell us pre-race? You said the V8 guys have done their job, the Cup guys have done their job. Now it's our turn to do our job. I guess you did that. A lot of pressure, man. We got to do well at Team Penske. Everyone else is rising up. Um, but that's what we did. We just tried to stay on it today, and um, I'm happy we could join the other groups. You guys have answered the bell. Congratulations. Thank you. Joseph Newgarden in victory lane, and Tim Sendrick, after his hip replacement, has hobbled to victory lane, and a happy bunch here for Team Penske. Kelly? Scott Dixon finishes one, this one second, sitting here on the pit wall with good reasons. You've just told me your drink bottle wasn't working that entire race. How physically demanding was this one? Yeah, it was definitely a tough race, just uh, we, we never really had any downtime. It was pretty flat out. We had one caution there, I think, but uh, it was pretty physical, at least uh, with no fluids. But the Penske Bank car was really fast on like the first 10 to 15 laps, and we could really pressure the Penskes. But uh, as soon as they got to the latter part, last 10 laps, we just sort of fell off a bit. So we need to definitely work on that. But uh, great day for us, points-wise. You know, myself, second, Felix, uh, and the NTT data car, you know, rolling up fourth is, is fantastic. Big points weekend for us. And uh, hopefully we can carry some momentum. Still want to win at this place, but a uh, huge credit to Joseph. You know, well done. Drove a hell of a race and a uh, nice little battle there with Will. I think it was pretty clean. Hopefully he wasn't uh, too uh, too angry with that, but I think it was good. I'll get to that battle with Will in a moment. But how much were you smelling the blood as Joseph was getting kind of held up by, by traffic? Yeah, it's hard in those situations. You know you know that uh, the lap traffic's trying to stay on, on the lap, you know, uh, on the lead lap. You know, they're, they're off strategy a little bit. Uh, Will kind of got held up a little bit, a little bit there, and, and uh, I think it was Marco maybe was racing him pretty hard. I'm not sure who it was in the end, um, and just got a run. You know, he got a little bit loose uh, out of uh, the, the last corner, got a run down the front straight, hit some OT, and, and uh, got a little bit of uh, touch and go here in the middle. We kind of switched place, switch places through two and two, and then three. Uh, I was just hoping he wasn't going to keep it on the inside of three because that would have been pretty hairy. But to come up so close and yet another runner up finish for you here. I mean, it sounds like you're taking the positives with it, but it's got to be a little bit frustrating not to close the deal here at St. Pete. Yeah, you, you've got to take the positives with it. You know, uh, we've had some pretty rough runs here at, at uh, you know, St. Pete. You know, typically we don't start the season too strong, but, you know, the car feels good. It doesn't feel perfect, so we've definitely got some areas to work on. But it just showed, you know, how balanced this team is. You know, they worked really hard today, covered all bases, and, you know, we wound up second. So uh, I thought we had a run there going on, Joseph. You know, once he started to catch some of the traffic, it seemed like he eased off a little bit, but it just wasn't enough. All right, but nonetheless, a solid point stake here for Scott Dixon. Kev? Felix Rosenquist, in his very first IndyCar race, led 31 laps. You told me before the race, eh, I don't know if we're ready to win or not. We're going to give it a go, but top five will be satisfying, is it? 
Yeah, for sure. I think there was a bit more in it. I mean, uh, I think some pit stops there didn't really go as planned, but the uh, entity data Honda was really good today. Uh, I think it was, it was a good, good enough package to win the race, but uh, yeah, just some small things didn't really go away, but I'm, I'm really happy to be up here. I really have to thank my team, Chip Ganesa Racing, for you know starting off the season uh, better than we anyone could expect, really. You served notice early on when you passed one of the great IndyCar drivers and Will Power. Tell me about that back and forth battle there for a little bit. Yeah, I mean, uh, I felt the pace in the beginning was really good, and then I sort of faded a little bit. Uh, but it was it was a good restart, and I was right on his tail there, and I uh, was able to go for a move. It was really dirty off lines, so it was hard to pull off the move. But uh, yeah, you know, our car was really fast there, and then I, th I think also my driving was, you know, I, I can work on things, especially towards the end of the race. and. I'm sure we could have been more or less that quick all the race, but uh, it's a long race, a lot of impressions, a lot to take in. It's a very long and physical race, especially. Uh, so I'm, I'm really worn out, I have to say. These, these cars are tough to drive, and uh, i never driven anything like it, but uh, it's a dream come true to just be here and uh, finish in fourth. Things he can learn, yet still, in his very first IndyCar race, Felix Rosenquist finishes fourth. Watch out for him. I think that was a fantastic effort to lead 31, to make a big power move on willpower and then come away with fourth place points was nice but it's new gardens day and we have got a whole lot more coming from st pete stay with us pretty good shot of one of the runways there at the albert witted airport right down below as we remind you when we're finished here in st petersburg coming up next it's ireland and france in six nations rugby the champions of last year's Six Nations Island up against France who have played very well this year so far and that's coming up when we are done here with the MTT IndyCar Series from St. Petersburg, Florida where Joseph Newgarden of Team Penske has come away victorious to start this new year in the right possible way. Kel? It's his teammate, Will Power, who brought the 12 car home in third. And he kind of said, Will, ahead of the race, hey, if you're not going to win this one, at least come away with a good solid points day. So is it mission accomplished? Yeah, definitely a lot better points than I've had the past two years. So uh, really happy about that. We just uh, put ourselves in a tough position pitting early there. We had no defense. And, and really me losing that position on the restart. You know, then I was stuck. I couldn't pull a gap to, to, to negate the cold tire penalty because I was pitting early. So just kind of did my best to, to maintain a third place finish i mean that was that was as much as we could do in that situation and got more points than than the last two years so we're in the game all right well it got a little bit racy between you at times uh, scott dixon just pointed out he said he thought the racing was clean between the two of you did you enjoy that yeah yeah no that was uh that was good clean racing uh i was really man he was so good off that last corner i uh I was surprised he got a run on me and um, yeah, we kind of went wheel to wheel there for a bit. Uh, yeah, it's good, good racing for sure. Obviously a good day as well for Team Penske. What does it do for the team as a whole to kind of set the tone here in week one of the IndyCar season? Yeah, well, I mean, when you look at the team <clears throat> winning in V8 Supercars, NASCAR and now IndyCar, you can show us how strong the team is. It's uh, great. And Chevrolet, I mean, they've done a great job with the engines. Uh, you know, I, I think that when, when I think about it, we've done a lot of work for street courses in the off-season and it's paid off. All right, I think the, the captain, Roger Penske, is going to be happy with this one, Marty. Winds up being in fifth place for Alexander Rossi today, and you told me a moment ago, the pace uh, just not there today or what? Yeah, not really. I mean, I think that had we started higher up, we probably could have maintained. It was a pretty big track position race, um, and ultimately we didn't really have the pace to, to run down the guys in front of us, and I think some of that stems from the fact that we were just a little bit behind the ball uh, this weekend. So with that being said, it's a, it's a top five, which is a decent way to start the, the year for the 27 Napa Andretti Honda. Um, but ultimately, we want, we want more, right? We came so close to winning last year, and to really not be in with a shot this year is disappointing. Um, but we have a couple weeks to reset uh, before we get to Coda. Towards the end of the race, lap traffic was certainly a factor. Factor Max Shilton kind of ran you a little too hard in the turn one, in your opinion? Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, but it's. It's kind of difficult with IndyCar. Um, you know, the rule is they don't have to, to let us by until um, they're lapped down to the whole field, which, you know, has its rights and wrongs. Um, but unfortunately, we lost a bit of time to, to Felix there. Um, but I'm sure he lost time as well with Max. So it's uh, it's the way it goes sometimes. And uh, ultimately, we probably didn't have enough to, to catch Felix anyways. You guys are so fit as IndyCar drivers, but I, you guys are exhausted. How tough were the conditions today out there, Alex? 
Yeah, this is, I mean, obviously it's the first race of the year, so, um, you know, it's 110 laps and it's pretty hot and humid here. And um, the first race is always the hardest one. And because right. it's a 110 lap street race, uh, it definitely takes its toll on you. And, um, you know, that's why we train so hard in the off season to make sure that we can maximize ourselves on days like this. And uh, if you train hard enough in the gym, hopefully it's uh, not too difficult on track. This is why you work so hard in December and January, so you can survive one of these hot races, Kevin. Fifth for Alexander Rossi. And six for James Hinchcliffe. Hot day. How did you survive it? Uh, I mean, not bad, all things considered. You know, we had a pretty strong car in the beginning, but, man, it was just so tough to pass. You know, we got stuck behind Ray Hall there, and uh, and he was stuck behind Harvey, and kind of nobody could make moves. And, you know, in the pit sequence, we managed to pick up a couple spots and obviously benefited from Ryan's problem. But, uh, man, that last stint, we drove over a... Uh, a piece of the banner that was coming off in turn three, wrapped around the front wing, around the underwing, and we lost a ton of downforce. So our car was an absolute handful, and you know, Chillin wasn't doing anybody any favors, so we spent the whole last stint just stuck behind him, but luckily Pagano couldn't move on us. So for the challenges that we had today, six is pretty good, guys were good in the pits, car was strong, so looking forward to Coda. We told the story of Robert Wickens and his return to the track before the race. Maybe his input is more in between sessions. I'm just curious, is there is there something he can provide even during a race, or is that more going to be when you guys spend some time between races and between sessions? Yeah, it's more between sessions for sure. You know, obviously there's a lot going on in the race, and uh, we got one guy on the radio, but, you know, Robbie was a huge benefit uh, in, between, uh, in between practices and in between qualifying on the grid. You know, we were talking strategies for the start. So it's, uh, it's such a benefit having him here, you know, and it's, it's just so great to see him back at the track, see the smile on his face, and see the smile on everyone's face is getting to see him. So really happy to have him back. All things considered, this is a pretty good points day and a strong start to the season for you, yes? Yeah, I mean, you know, we had a problem in qualifying. We probably should have started in the top six, which uh, may change the, uh, the look of our race a little bit. So, you know, we had a little bit better pace than we showed in qualifying, a little bit better pace probably than we showed in the race. We just need to go to Austin and execute. You know, got to execute Friday in practice, Saturday in qualifying, and on race day, obviously. And if we can do that, I think we're going to be right at the sharp end of the grid. And I think birthday plans for Robbie and Marco this week. Is that right? Yeah, they share the same birthday, and uh, and Rob's turning 30, so uh, we're taking him down somewhere warm to get a little little sun. He hasn't had much outside time in the last seven months, so we're going to put him on a beach for a couple of days. Be careful, you guys are Canadian. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it, may, it may burn easily. So let's follow up, guys, on what James Hinchcliffe was referring to there, and there is part of that banner. Well, that's uh, that's what happens when it stays on track. At some point, somebody's going to run over it. Not a huge piece of material, but uh, yeah, they pretty, like running these races green. Pretty obvious. Somebody at some point near the end ran over it and blew it all apart because there was some pieces of it around all around the track. But the one thing I take away from this race so far is everybody looks pretty gassed. Yeah. First race of the year, pretty hot out today. So the guys are looking pretty wore out. Well, let's keep talking about the uh, victorious team, Team Penske. More on that, here's Marty. And it winds up being a good day for Simon Pagano. We'll get to how tough the race was, you know, just from a physical standpoint in a moment. But how about the recovery for you starting 13th? I would say 7th. You probably got a smile on your face. Happy about that. Yeah, um, obviously, you know, result is important. But, um, man, the car felt so good. I, I really enjoyed driving the race. Um, we had a, an awesome Chevy uh, Menard's car today. Just hooked up, man. When I was in clean air, we could uh, really kill some lap time. Uh, we got the second fast lap of the race. And, I felt very confident, drove 100% the whole time. And that is what I'm going to take for the rest of the season. I think it's a great foundation going forward. Um, like I just told you, Dixon finished eight here yeah. last year. So, hey, we're one place ahead of him he was. So uh, that's a good sign. Had you had track position and really been able to get a clean lap in qualifying, could you have competed with your teammate, Joseph Newgarden and Will Power? Absolutely, yeah. And we'll compete the next races. Um, you know, obviously, qualifying was on a, an outside factor. We. Um, didn't didn't get to really put a lap down so um you know you start where you start and then you got to fight but uh we would have uh challenged these guys for the win no no question uh, with a car like that no problem how tough was it today in these conditions you know sometimes it's not really the heat that's out there but the humidity and it's very humid here today in st pete yeah that gave me a uh, gray hair <laughs> um you can uh, color it like elio if you want just, to just like elio was watching i know that so uh, no, it, it's definitely super physical, especially, you know, first race of the season. It's the first time um, you're back in race mode, and um, we pushed 100% the whole time. So yeah. two, two hours 20, um, going full throttle, um, it was really, really hard, but uh, training paid off. 
How about, how about these young guys today, Felix Rosenquist and then Colton Herta? I mean, how impressive are they as rookies? Yeah, so Rosenquist uh, led for a while. Um, Colton uh, did a really good job. You know, he could have got in trouble a lot of the time I was when I was around him, and he didn't. Showed really uh, a lot of um, you know things. He, he showed being smart. So. Um, yeah, uh, but you know what? I'm focused on myself. <laughs> there you go. The uh, veteran Simon Pagino impressed with these very young rookies. And now we have one of those young rookies in Colton Herta, who is just getting some compliments there from Simon Pagino. A really strong showing for you. Eighth place in the end. So just how satisfied are you with this result? It, it was good. You know, I have to be happy with it. I'm kind of... Uh, you know, it, it, it could have been better. You know, I made a mistake on the on the first restart, and we went back to like 17th, 18th. So, I'm proud of all the guys, and I'm, I'm proud that we got to fight back all up into the uh, into the top 10. But uh, yeah, obviously, could have been a better day. So, a little bit disappointed, but starting off the year right. And some fun on track action, uh, including some moments I believe with Zach Veach. If you'll take us through what these these moments were like for you. Yeah, I wasn't really sure what he was doing because he, he moved to the inside to defend and then I moved to the outside and then he moved to the outside so then I went up the inside so um, yeah that's kind of what happened once I got by him is it, it was really smooth sailing and we were able to move up some positions from there all right and we're standing in front of the 98 pit box because you came over here had a little debrief with your father Brian what, what was that exchange like Oh, we were just talking about, you know, how, how the race went and how tired I am and stuff. So, um, yeah, luckily it'll be uh, have a little bit of time to rest and then I'll be in the car in Sebring 12 hours next weekend and then it'll be code after that. And finally, I know there's a, a lot to learn in this race. And at one point you're really trying to hit your fuel numbers. How challenging is it to hit a number while you're out there in the middle of a race? Oh, it's so tough, especially near the end of the race when when you know your mind's kind of starting to unfocus and stuff and that's kind of when the mistakes happened and uh yeah yeah you know it's it's really tough and 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 to hit the we, we did a good job with it you know i think i was learning every lap and you know once you get to that fuel number it's really easy to stay there and it's really easy to find some pace after that all right well on the imsa side of things coming off a win at uh, daytona we'll see you in sebring thank you colton jan and Kelly, so interesting when you hear the dynamic range between veterans and a rookie like Colton Herta. His last race, by the way, he'll do in an IndyCar at 18 years old. He'll be 19 by the next event. But just incredible, his maturity. You hear Simon Pagino say, yeah, you know, he had some opportunities to get in trouble, but he didn't. He was very mature. And, and we've seen that. It's just been amazing, his maturity level at 18. Well, think about when you were 18 and you were coming up the ladder. I, mean, I wasn't you, that mature. <laughs> you, but you weren't running an Indy car, and that's what's amazing. Him and Padua Ward are teenagers, and he and he said he's tired. Let me tell you something. He looks a thousand times better than he did last year at Sonoma when they laid him on the wall, and you thought you were going to have to revive him. He looks like he's 15, and he weighs 120 pounds, so he's going to get tougher. And, but it, just, it was just kind of a good day for the little guys. I mean, Jack Harvey finished 10th. Santino Ferrucci was 9th or Ferrucci Santino, whoever one, PT wants to call him. I like that name. And I just think it was kind of a good day for those guys, the, the smaller teams. But at the top, Jan, the same old guys. Penske, Ganassi, Andretti. But, you know, they revealed some very interesting information. And I think some of this race turned on that early strategy. For instance, for Will Power. Will Power and Roger Penske, they saw Sebastian Borde, they saw smoke out of the back. And when you're a strategist, you have to make an instant decision. Do I think they're going to go yellow? Shall I pit? And Penske made a very late decision. In fact, we saw that replay where Will Power barely made it in. And then in the same Penske camp, Tim Sindrick, who, of course, competes against Penske, even though it's his boss, yep. they went completely the other direction, went later, tried reds, and it turned out to be quite a barn burner in the end. Well, I think the other thing, you watched how hard these guys run today, and there was a lot of good passing. This is a this is a great little straight race. I mean, it always has been since 2003. It's, there's places to pass, and there's action all the time. But it all comes down to pit stops sometimes. And just Penske's always had the best pit stops, and Ganassi and Andretti and those three guys. And again, you even heard Felix Rosenquist say it. Well, the pit stops didn't quite go like we wanted to. And they weren't, they, were, they weren't bad pit stops. They just weren't the best. Right. Well, the key is when do they happen? So when they say good or bad pit stops, nowadays everyone, they're hitting like seven-second pit stops. But the key is when do you do it? You heard Alexander Rossi say it's all about track position because there wasn't a lot of yellow. Making that decision when to pit, Lee, seemed to be the key. Yeah, indeed, indeed. And, guys, let's keep the racing theme going. It's been busy here in Florida, Daytona, last night for Supercross. Of course, IndyCar here today in St. Pete. Next weekend, 
It is the famed 12 hours of Sebring and have a look at the list of drivers that will do both that and today and there, Alexander Rossi, Ben Hanley for Dragon Sport, Colton Herder. He won the Rolex 24 at Daytona in, in the uh, GTLM. And Scott Dixon, Sebastian Bourdais will be in the Ganassi Ford, Simon Pagano. And yes, at the bottom of that list, but no means by at the bottom on purpose, Townsend Bell, our T Bell who is ostensibly leading the GTD class. Looking forward to that. That's going to be on CNBC and NBCSN. More from St. Pete right after this. It's pretty easy to understand why we enjoy coming to St. Petersburg for the season opener for the NTT IndyCar Series, isn't it? Just beautiful. What a weekend it has been. And celebrating best of all is Joseph Newgarden with his 11th career victory over the reigning series champion Scott Dixon and Will Power enjoying their time on the podium. Big story is Felix Rosenquist, the rookie, in fourth. Great start to his career yeah, in the absolutely. IndyCar. Absolutely, the rookie field, all of them finishing well. So we're going to have a nice little fight for rookie of the year. Marco soldiered on for a top 13 finish, started away at the back. And one of the, speaking of rookies, Santino Ferrucci did a terrific job, Kelly, finishing in the top 10. Yeah, he sure did. A ninth place finish for Santino. It was hard to miss that bright, chromed out silver David Yerman machine. But uh, Santino, how were you guys able to recover after the mistake in qualifying? How do you start from the rear? Oh, man, uh, I can't thank our uh, 19 crew enough. You know, all of our boys from Honda and our, all of our race engineers did a hell of a job. We had a solid pit stop. and. Uh, you know, he came on the radio and said, well, we're going to shortcut it and, uh, you know, short pit, undercut some people, and uh, you're going to have to save some fuel. We didn't realize how much fuel he had to save until we were about three steps past the worst step we had to. So I was like, hmm, let's make for a very long 35-lap uh, uh, stint, but we made it happen, and I'm very happy to come home in the top ten. Well, we look at some of the highlights of your race first at the start of this one, uh, and then we'll get to some moments where it looked like you and Colton Hurdle were having a moment, but take a look at your start. Oh yeah, this was this was wild. You know, I was just kind of watching my mirrors, and making sure uh, I wasn't gonna get, you know, me and Chilton were gonna be stay clean. And it's coming through. I was just looking for a hole, and I was just like, man, this track feels really narrow right now. You know, coming down into the turn turn four over here, and I just decided, you know what, I'm just gonna stay on the clean line and maybe avoid making too many mistakes. And you know, Laced was like a, a moving robot block, and he was pretty quick too. So. No, it's so hard to get around him at that point. But I, I love this helmet cam. I mean, how cool is that? It's very cool, and we appreciate you having that on board. It's such a, a neat perspective to get those onboards and those helmet cams. All right, talk about the physicality of it, because we've seen a lot of guys, veterans included, by the way, a little bit knackered getting out of these cars. Oh, yeah, I mean, there you go with my move on, trying to move on Herta, but I mean, he's a tough competitor. And, you know, I'm sure me and him are both feeling it after today. This, this is a long race. I mean, I'll be honest with you, my arm started to seize up 20 laps to go, and, uh, you know, it makes it difficult, especially when you're doing fuel strategy, you're adjusting the brake bias, you know, trying to save the rears, and, uh, you know, it all worked out, and I'm happy we could keep Harvey behind because he's a fierce competitor, and uh, we had Ray Hall in front, who I think was uh, had to pit again. So, you know, we just kept it clean and kept it out of the walls, even though I tapped a couple along the way and uh, came home. Well, great job out there, Santino. Thank you so much. And another one of those tough competitors is standing by with Kevin. IndyCar race number 10 for Jack Harvey and your first top 10. Well done. What was your day like? Uh, kind of long, mate, honestly. Uh, we had a good start. I think we finished the opening sequence still in seventh. So right where we started. I mean, honestly, we just liked a little bit of pace in a race. I think we obviously all think we know why, but we're going to analyze it, obviously, before Cota. And I think on the whole, it's one of those weekends where... It's, just, it, it's hard to be disappointed with what we've done because it was our best qualifying position, it's our best race position, but and so we, frankly, we're achieving every expectation we wanted. Expectations are like the wind a bit. As soon as you have a good qualifying session, you're immediately looking at having a better race. So um, try and find a little bit of pace for next time, but I think on the whole, we started the season very strong. And that's probably the big difference between last year when you had a six race program and this year where you're doing about two thirds of the races. Now you can have reasonable expectations. I mean, absolutely. Uh, I mean, and frankly, you know, we've all spoke about it as a team, but we have expectations of that of a full time entrant. Uh, so every time we come to the track, we want to qualify in the top 12, we want to finish in the top 10. You know, I think if, if you can achieve that all year long, then you and uh, I want you to watch this too. You're battling with Hinch, your pseudo teammate. Yeah. Well, I think that was pretty, just kind of racing, really. I gave him 
I gave him space and you know nowhere else to really go. But I think James is a guy that I trust. Just being there with um, you know just a solid guy off the track, solid guy on the track, and you know I think it contributes so much to the team. Honestly, we're just gonna try and learn what he did a little bit better in in, uh, in driving, what the car setup difference was, and try and do a better job in Kota. That was the consensus that I think the broadcasters had too. Good, solid racing. Nice job. Thank you. It was well done to the 24-year-old British driver Jack Harvey from Lincoln in England in the northeast. It was a good day for his Meyer Shank Honda team. However, here's the man, Joseph Newgarden, led 60 of the 110 laps that's a solid day that's a sound performance how about gavin ward his engineer on the box first time on the box he comes from the four-time world championship winning red bull formula one team and now he's guided joseph newgarden to a victory and both of their bosses is tim sindrick he's standing by with marty yeah we're sitting here chatting about the big race win for these guys today and so i want to know about the the decision there to run long in that one segment how nerve-wracking is that on top of the timing stand but but that is what at the end of the day flipped the track position yeah, without a doubt it's, it's risk and reward and you know the driver was up for it to start the race he said look you know we've got one lap on the qualifying tires because we presented him a, you know said look this is going to be outside the norm i think everybody's going to run stickers but if we run the scuffs to start the race of uh, the sticker set of reds that we can differentiate ourselves a bit not sure if we want to use them at the end because that's the longest stint yep. and when those guys pitted in front of him he did a great job of just knocking out laps but as you know as you're doing that those five or six laps knowing that if caution comes you're the zero <laughs> yeah you're done for the day and uh you know it was, it was somewhat refreshing to know that dixon was doing it with us I mean, obviously he's going to be the guy at the end of the year that you're racing with so um you know the two of us just you know blasted out the laps and and then, uh, you know, we decided to go to the Reds knowing that we could just clear traffic, but we could probably get a gap on a lot of the other guys that we could use toward the end of the race. And obviously, Joseph did a great job, and the guys did a great job in the pit. So, it's, you know, for us to start the season out this way, it's, it's a good time, obviously. When you look at Joseph today versus him when he came here his first year with Team Penske, how's he a different driver right now? He's patient, you know. Probably not the most patient guy, he'll probably tell you. Um, but today there were a couple opportunities he had where, where he, you know, he might have stuck it in there a couple years ago and taken a chance. And today he told me, he said, you know, I had a winning car. I just needed the opportunity to win, and I waited. And, you know, that, that's the maturity that you need to win championships. Obviously he's proved he can win a championship, but, um, you know, he's, he's learned that part of it. But in his third year, he's certainly more comfortable. He understands us. He has a new race engineer this year. You know, he worked with Gavin at the end of last year. But for those guys to get off on the right foot and win a race together and, and that whole group, it's, uh, you know, pretty satisfying for them. How are you holding up after a couple hours on the timing stand after your hip replacement? Man, I'm all good. I, 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 <laughs> I couldn't imagine being better. I mean, it's been just over two weeks or whatever else. And, you know, I can walk if I need to. And, uh, yeah, by the time I get back from Sebring next week, I think it'll be back to normal. I think a win may help that recovery a little bit for Tim Sendrick and Team Penske. Great to hear Tim get into further depth and explanation about how they constructed Joseph Newgarden's victory. What a drive, what a team effort. Excellent performance. And we come back to St. Petersburg. We'll wrap it up, finishing off round one of the season. Okay, so we're being greedy. We've only just finished race one, but we're already looking forward to race two, and that's in just two weeks' time at Circuit of the Americas in Austin, Texas. This is an amazing world-class facility, and you're going to see the NTT IndyCar Series race there. There was a uh, two-day event, two full days, a three-day event with Media Day, and then two days of spring training a couple of weeks ago, and young Colton Herter did very, very well. You'll see that March 24, 1 p.m. Eastern, right here on NBCSN. Can't wait to be back in the Lone Star State to see open wheel racing at Circuit of the Americas. So, and there's a little menu for you. Of course, practice on NBC Sports Gold, and you will see uh, qualifying on NBCSN. Let's hear from a couple more drivers. We kick it off with Kelly. And we'll start here with Spencer Piggott, who had a solid day here for Ed Carpenter Racing. Brought the, the 21 car in 11th place. You told me you needed to be more consistent in running up front. I saw you as high as fourth. You end up 11th. How happy are you with this day? Uh, I think we, we come away definitely wanting more. You know, uh, the first half of the race was a bit of a struggle, kind of got shuffled back a bit at the start and then uh, spent the rest of the race trying to make that up. And, you know, the second half of the race, uh, we seemed to be able to, to do some, some decent laps and gain some ground and, and pass a few cars. So, um, you know, big thanks to everyone at, at Governor Racing and Auto Geek for their support. But, you know, for sure we, we want to be higher up. And, you know, I think we have what it takes to be up there. We just kind of have to put it all together. 
All right, we'll see you in two weeks' time at Coda. Kev? Kelly Graham Ray Hall finished 12th. He had to take an extra pit stop, a puncture, about a third of the way through the race. What might have been if that didn't happen? Well, I mean, I thought that the United Reynolds machine was pretty strong today. Um, you know, Hinch, Hinch was about equal to us. I thought we were maybe a little better than Alex. Um, but we were struggling to kind of get around Harvey at that point. He And Hinch said the same. He had a ton of straight line speed. So, you know, coulda, shoulda, woulda, I don't know. But, I mean, it was a shame to get a puncture when we did. It seems like, you know, we've been on a little string of bad luck here. The last few races of last year, kick off this year. But hopefully they'll turn around in a hurry. So, I'm excited. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm happy with what I saw, though, our, our competitiveness. This weekend versus the year last year was significantly better. And uh, my hopes and my expectations going forward are pretty high. All right, we knew the mustache would stay with a win. We'll see if he has it in a couple of weeks at Austin. He says no. I thought, I thought the mustache went if he won. So he's going to have to keep it, although I think uh, wife Courtney may uh, insist that it goes for sure as the celebrations continue in victory lane for Joseph Newgarden. PT, what are your thoughts? I mean, you were the first person to ever win on this track in IndyCar. What did you make of today? Well, I thought it was a good, hard race. Guys were working hard. Uh, look, everybody looks a little bit wore out. It was a hot race. It was a fast race. So a uh, bunch of guys are going with you to Sebring, another exciting event for us on NBC. So I'm excited. We've got three in a row coming up. We've got Coda coming up just yeah. a couple weeks away. So guys are going to be ready to rock and roll. Quick thoughts? You know, for me, it was coming into this weekend as, as surprises. Are we going to see anybody really jump up? And the answer so far is not really. Top three teams at the top of the charts. I think Felix Rosenquist, yeah. we expected big things. He absolutely delivered. I think it's very exciting to watch what he can sort of chalk up in terms of results this season. And then the rookies uh, outside of him, the pure rookie, Colton Herta. What a, what a weekend. I've got some bad news for you, too. You can't have eight and a half hours sleep at Sebring. It's only a 12-hour <laughs> race. But we're going to look forward to calling your action there. Let's check in on the uh, Peacock Pit Box one more time with Jan and Robin. Your thoughts, guys, on a good opening day? Well, I think in particular that some of the new teams have also, they weren't as far behind the big teams as we might have expected. We see some rookies. So certainly we see some of the same players hitting the podium, but we see a lot of new teams with promise. Three predictions. I said before the season, Rosenquist was going to win one or two races. Hell, let's make it three. Marco Andretti's going to win a race if he gets some luck. And three, NBC executives. We need one of these big booths, big boxes for the uh, IndyCar series. I'll help pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> Put the pressure on. Well, that's it. It's been a big weekend. It's been a fun weekend. Uh, and it's been a very thorough weekend of covering the NTT IndyCar series uh, for the first of 17 races this year. And we are so excited about Memorial Day weekend and our very first uh, Indianapolis 500. The results one more time just to show you who finished where. And we've spoken to the majority of those drivers. And I think there's a lot of personal bests there. The drivers are going to come away feeling very good about their respective efforts today. And then there are the drivers who were bounced out prematurely. And they've got some catching up to do when we head to Circuit of the Americas. But coming up next here on NBCSN, it's Six Nations Rugby, and that's Ireland up against France. And a reminder, two weeks' time, it is the IndyCar Classic from Circuit of the Americas, Sunday, March 24, 1 o'clock Eastern, right here on NBCSN, your home of motorsport. So, and be sure to check out the new motorsports on NBC channel on YouTube. As we say, thanks for watching. We'll see you in two weeks. We congratulate Joseph Newgarden and Team Penske.